five. I'm out of here. Ready to go? Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order the January 25th meeting of the Comox Valley Regional District. I want to acknowledge that Director Lee's on the call. We are meeting on the unceded and traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. Um, and I'd like to um, read um, through UNDRIP. Uh, Article 45, nothing in this declaration may be construed as dis diminishing or extinguishing the rights Indigenous peoples have now or may acquire in the future. Also, I'd just like to note um, that our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Williams Lake First Nation um, with uh, the news of their finding of, of their children and thoughts and prayers with them and we share their pain. Um, before we go on to the agenda, um, we do have an item in the addendum, um, and I should ask um, if the board would be willing to uh, place that under new business. Can I get a motion? Not so moved, Chair. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any comments about discussion, discussing the uh, item, the UBCM poverty, poverty Reduction Grant? Hearing and seeing none. Anyone opposed? And that is carried. So we will move that out of the addendum and into new business. We have adoption of minutes from January 11th. Move adoption. Second. Move. Cole Hamilton and Warren. Any questions on the minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Now, um, for Director Lee, I do believe we have a number of items um, for that pertain to the Black Creek Oyster Bay service in the bylaws and resolutions. They are items G5, G6, G7, and G8. Um, would anyone I'll move, I'll move that those items be considered now. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any questions? Is anyone opposed? And that is carried. So we will move down to those items in uh, under bylaws, starting with G5. They Did start on H5? G5, yes. So yeah, that they, is the they, um, bylaw 695, the Northern Fire Service areas um, for first and second reading. Move first and second. Um, second. May I? May I propose a possible um, consideration of an amendment to that bylaw? Please go ahead. Okay, I would move to amend the definition section 1D, uh, where it says, quote, board shall mean the board of directors of, and um, that it recognizes and includes uh, area D as a participant in this service at the board, because that is not mentioned. And I, I think I need to be, Area D needs to be mentioned in there as a, an extraterritorial member of the board. I will second that amendment just so that we can have staff um, comment on it. And I, I, could I turn it over to Jake to comment? Yes, thank you, Director Lee, and uh, through the chair. So uh, the definition for board does currently reference the CVRD board of directors, and I would suggest that that definition should remain the same. Uh, certainly, Director Lee is correct that as an extraterritorial member, uh, she participates in matters concerning Black Creek Oyster Bay services. Uh, but ultimately, it is the board that makes those decisions, and it's based on the participants of the service that may vote on that. And that participant would include Area D as a participant in the service. So. Um, I respect the interest there, certainly, but, uh, but would suggest that the definition as it currently stands is adequate and appropriate. Okay. As long as everyone understands that I letters patent area D is part of this service and we are part of the board that makes a decision on this service when, when there's Black Creek Oyster Bay fire and water issues coming up. So 
as long as everyone knows that and we don't get dropped off the planet, that would be good. Director Lee, um, we have your amendment on the table. Would you like to withdraw it or do you want to vote on that? Um, is there a problem with including it in the definitions uh, through the chair to, to our legislative services? Would there be a problem specifying that Area D is part of the board for the purposes of this service? Well, just give us a second. Uh, through the chair, so um, uh, certainly, uh, I, again, you know, I, I understand the point being referenced here with respect to the participation of Area D in those decisions, um, but the board membership, as it does with respect to solid waste, it expands to include other areas that are participants and services, and, and, and references to those services, again, it is referenced to the CBRD board as that is the governing body of the regional district, and so I'm a little bit hesitant to suggest that we should be uh, specifying uh, those participating areas that may be outside of the CVRD, uh, given that it's inherent as part of the governance of the service and of the board that, that those participants uh, may have voting rights with respect to such services. Okay, well, I'll let that go on that understanding and withdraw that motion. Thank you. So we're back to the original motion for first and second reading. It's been moved and seconded. Is there anyone opposed? I, ha and it's I, have, I, have, another, I have another question or potential uh, amendment. Uh, um, I've already called the question, um, Director Lee, I apologize. Um, it, is a, it is a vote of areas B, C, and D. Um, and you can vote against if you want. Um, I'm going to call that question. Is does anyone ha have any opposition to bylaw 695 as it's presented? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. We have a motion for third reading of, of bylaw 695. May I ask at third reading whether six brackets one, where it says the um service may be amended from time to time with the approval from all three participants. Um, so I thought the establishment bylaw was would be more solid than that, that we wouldn't be amending the service area from time to time. From time, to time. Um, my concern is that Area D over the years has put in hundreds, thousands of dollars into these services and we want to know that the established services are still going to be there for us and they're not going to be amended but from time to time by anyone without our consent. I'm going to ask staff to res respond. Thank you chair. Yes, um, respecting that clause while it does provide uh, for a, a statement around the amendment to the service areas that such an amendment would be in accordance with the act which has specific requirements and steps, legislative steps in regards to the approval of such an amendment. So that would still fall to the Black Creek Oyster Bay Services to com Committee to consider any amendment to the service area. Um, and it would not uh, subvert or uh, miss any steps in that regard. So I wanna assure you that um, that the services, service areas being amended from time to time would follow the same legislative process that they always have. Okay, okay, I'll just let that go too. Are there any other questions or comments on bylaw 695? Hearing and seeing none, uh, are there, is there anyone opposed? And that is carried. Um, and we're moving on, I believe, to item number six. Uh, bylaw 696, the Black Creek Oyster Bay local water local service area bylaw amendment. Move first and second reading. Move adoption. Well, we have to do I think first, we're just and second. first and second, sorry. Move first and second. Second. Seconded. And other comments or questions? Are we on seven? We're on number six. Six. Oh, I'm sorry. It's By, all. Bylaw 696. Right. You're just ahead of us, Director Bree. Uh, I was looking for a comments? A e. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing and seeing none, it's a vote of the full board. Anyone opposed? And that is carried. And Move we third. have bylaw 696 for third reading. Move third. Second. Second. 
Moved and seconded. Any comments? Hearing and seeing none, anyone opposed? And that is carried. We're on to item seven for adoption of bylaw 689, the Northern Fire Protection Service area. I'll move it again. Thank you. Second. Moved and seconded. Questions, comments? Hearing and seeing none, anyone opposed? And that has been adopted. And then finally, number eight, bylaw 624, the Black Creek Oyster Bay Fire Protection Local Service Area Conversion. Move for adoption. Director Arbor, second by Director Lee. Um, questions? <coughs> Hearing and seeing none, anyone opposed? And that is carried. Thank you very much, Director Lee. You're, you're Thank welcome you. to stay. Um, I gotta we'll go and get ready for tomorrow's SRD meetings. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move back up on the agenda. And I believe we are at business arriving from, arising from the minutes. Move the recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded. And would our CAO have any other questions, comments on that? Uh, no, other than this would be expected by the uh, the group and appreciated by them. And uh, we certainly will report back to you when we have some options available. Uh, is, I believe there's a hand up, Director Hillian. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, Thank Chair. You, I, I, sorry, Doug, I just need to cut in. I need to remove myself because I have a conflict. Okay. Thank you one. for acknowledging. I'll just give a minute. Um, please go ahead, uh, Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair Hamir. I just wanted to share with uh, the, the board that I had the opportunity to, to uh, tour the uh, local search and rescue facilities last week. And um, it was certainly a, um, an eye opener for me. It was the first opportunity that I had had to see the extent of the equipment they have and to understand more fully the servicing needs that they have. I would urge any other board member who may be interested to uh, contact uh, Mr. Berry and take advantage of that opportunity. And I sincerely hope that um, we're able to help this uh, stellar organization that has done so much uh, for our community, standing at the ready for so many years, relying pretty much entirely on volunteer help. I, I sincerely hope that we're able to help them to find a, a permanent home. Thanks very much. Thanks for those comments, Director Hillian, and much appreciated. Are there any other questions? I have one question. We have another item on the agenda that refers to one of the other delegations, but um, we don't have a response to the delegation from the farmer's market. Would staff like to um, just uh, let folks know what, what's happening with that? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. At the uh, same meeting, uh, we, you received a delegation from the farmer's market asking about improvements to transit service for the, the farmer's market, to which um, our manager of um, transit and sustainability, Mike Zabarski, has reached out to the group and will be sure to include them in the planning processes that we have in the future with respect to transit to ensure their interests are, are presented and considered through those processes. Thank you for that. Um, it's great to let the public know what's happening and all the wheels that are turning in the background. Um, so on the recommendation, is there anyone opposed? And that is carried. Moving on, uh, item number one under reports, BC assessment to 2022 role for receipt. Sure. Moved and seconded and over to staff. And uh, I just referred to Jake Martins. Thank you, Chair, and my apologies. I just want to confirm that Director McCollum is back uh, on the call, and also just to confirm that uh, when conflict is, conflicts of interest are declared, uh, the nature of the conflict must also just be stated just for the record as well. So um, I'm not sure if she's back, just hoping she is, of course, because she's participating electro electronically. Can anyone text uh, Director McCollum to make sure that she comes back? Thank you. Oh, there oh. we go. She's here. And now she's coming back. I see. And would you like her to present now? Yeah, she just. Yeah. Director McCollum, while we're bringing up the presentation, um, could, would you mind stating for staff what the nature of the conflict was? Oh, uh, sorry. My um, husband's a member of um, the Comox Valley Search and Rescue. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we are back to the BC assessment rule. And we have a presentation. And I believe Morris is here from um, from BC Assessment. 
Can yes, I, I am. Over to you? Great. Good to okay. see you again. Yes, thank you very much for having me again today, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year to you. I'm just going to share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, I think we've given your you uh, the ability to share. Yes. Okay. Let's just make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Can everyone see the presentation screen in front of you there? Yes, it's there. Thanks. Go okay. ahead. Thank you. So again, thank you very much for having me back in 2022. Um, first off, I'd like to acknowledge that BC Assessments in Nanaimo office, where I'm located, is located on the traditional territories of the Sinebu Nation of the Coast Salish people. I'd like to thank Kevin Deville, Manager of Financial Planning, for inviting me back uh, again this year to talk about a very interesting 2022 assessment role. So again, thank you for having me back. Um, so here are the topics we're going to discuss today. Um, you've probably seen some of this before, but it's always good for a bit of a refresher. A little bit about BC assessment, valuation, classification, some key cycle uh, and assess uh, assessment and cycle dates, the relationship between assessment and taxes, which is very important this year. Um, the 2022 assessment rule overview, which I'm sure has caught your attention by now, and the, um, the appeal process and where we stand today on that. So we'll just go right into it here. So formed in 1974 under the Assessment Authority Act, uh, we are a provincial crown corporation operating independent of taxing function and politics. Um, we provide fair and uniform assessments to all property owners in British Columbia. Um, in, uh, when we were formed back in 1975, we had a, a mere under a million properties assessed and now we're over 2.2 million properties assessed provincially. Uh, just a bit of education or a refresher. Um, the, um, the assessment role is an annual list of values, identifying ownership value, classification and exemptions for each property. Represents over 2.1 million properties, which I've said before. This year, we have a, an assessed value, uh, total value on the assessment role of 2.4 trillion, which is up almost 400 billion over last year. Uh, and, and we endeavor to provide you, uh, our local governments and our taxpayers and our citizens of BC, a predictable base for taxing authorities to raise about $8.3 billion annually in property taxes for schools and local services. And as you know, we value properties in a couple of ways. We use market value as of July 1st, and this, is, this applies to residential and commercial properties. And why do we use market value? It's internationally recognized as the fairest system for distributing the property tax burden as properties with similar values pay similar taxes. And it's easy to confirm through an assessment search. You can go online and look at residential and commercial property values. What does this mean to you? It means that values fluctuate annually based on what's happening in the market. Taxes are, are distributed fairly among property classes um, for equity purposes. Um, we also have some properties that are valued on legislative rates, such as utilities, farms, um, and managed forest. So there are some factors that affect market value, and we've seen quite a few uh, impacts to market this year. Location, proximity to amenities, transit, employment, recreation, land use controls, um, which could be anything like com official community plan, neighborhood plan, zoning, and restrictive covenants. Uh, land characteristics, area shape, topography, access, and utilities and service, all have a play on the valuation of a property and what the market is willing to bear to pay for a particular property. Um, and for uh, building characteristics, use, size, quality, age, condition also come into, into play in the valuation. Uh, income potential for commercial properties per se, rentable value expenses, management and structural repairs and maintenance vacancy and capitalization rates are all taken into consideration. One of the cornerstones of our valuation is highest and best use analysis. Um, local governments can help use this to determine highest and best use by ensuring BC assessment has the information required to determine um, what's um, important to the valuation. Um, what is physically possible? What is affected by access to services and geotechnical constraints, example, slope stability rock croppings, that would be considered a physical aspect what uses are legally permissible. So land use controls, uh, including official community plans, zoning, land uses, designations, restrictive covenants, bylaws, et cetera, 
will influence what is legally permissible to, to do on that particular property. And what is financially feasible need? Uses generate a return above and beyond the cost to develop them, these properties. So if, if you can develop a property and make a profit, then it's deemed financially feasible. Um, and um, maximally productive of the physically possible, legally permitted and financially feasible uses, which results in the highest, which will result in the highest value. How land use affects our market. Um, local governments primarily impact highest and best use via their land use controls and development approvals as market value is impacted, impacted by the legal approved uses of a property. When land use controls change to permit a high, per se, a higher density, the highest and best use of a site can also change with that, which may lead to a change in market value should market evidence whether and in our business is typically sales dictated that, that a change is warranted. And then that will be uh, reflected out on your assessment role as of July 1st. Um, as you know, we have, we have the prescribed property class regulation, uh, which helps us distribute that burden of taxes among similar properties with a, a similar grouping. Um, property classes allow a variable tax rate system, different tax rates by different property types as I just mentioned, partial or complete exemptions from assessment or taxation reside in other acts like this, the school act, the community charter, the local government act, the rural taxation act. Um, so residential properties, just to give you a quick overview of what falls into each category as a bit of a refresher. Uh, class one residential land or improvements are both used for residential purposes, uh, single family dwelling, duplexes, multifamily apartments, condos, manufactured homes. Um, Class two, uh, utilities, transportation, transmission, or distribution by pipeline, telecommunications, uh, transmission of messages by means of electronic uses, signals, or compensation. Or, sorry, yeah, compensation, generation, transmission, or distribution of electricity. Class three must include only the eligible supportive housing property designated in Schedule B for the supportive uh, for supportive housing. So this is released by cabinet every year and uh, we can only apply those supportive housing uh, values of $1 and $1 to the land and improvements based on the order from cabinet. Uh, major industry, land use in conjunction with the operation of industrial improvements and does, uh, in industrial improvements, um, class five can be um, used as gathering pipeline, uh, held for purpose of extracting, processing, manufacturing, transporting products, or use for the storage of products as ancillary to the conjunction of extracting and processing. Um, class six business and other, I like to call this the catch-all, includes all land and improvements not included in classes one to five and seven through nine, which I'll go over those for you right now as well. Class seven is exclusively property that must include only land meeting the definition of managed forest land. Um, class eight, not for profit, whole host of, of uh, recreational uses that would apply to this, parks, et cetera. And then farmland, land classified as farm by the prescribed uh, regulation, farm regulation and meeting uh, income requirements based on area and production and uh, income. Okay, and just to give you um, a, a bit of a refresher on this as well, um, of course, we're, we're governed by the Assessment Act, which has within it a cycle of key dates that we must adhere to every year to produce the annual assessment rule. Um, so we'll start at the top where we are right now. We're right in the inquiry period. Um, January 31st is the PARP appeal deadline. PARP is the Property Assessment Review Panel, uh, independent panel uh, appointed by the ministry to uh, hear uh, public appeals around assessed values. So we're right in the middle of hearing all the questions and, and um, complaints around uh, uh, property assessments. And then we'll move after the, the appeal deadline passes, which is Monday, January the 31st. So keep that in mind. If you have consist, consist, constituents in your, in your areas that um, feel that they need to, they've called us already and they, and they want to appeal their assessment, they have it till midnight, January the 31st on Monday. There's no exceptions to that. February 1st to March 30 to March 15th, uh, we, we hear the appeals in the property assessment review panel. And then we begin our revised role production, which we will then produce to 
um, finance your revised 2022 assessment rule, which will reflect any of the changes that were made through the property assessment review panel. When we go uh, into the spring and summer, we complete a host of, of uh, assessment projects to complete the annual rule, review sales, do subdivisions, examine uh, OCP changes, get out in the field and look at, look at properties firsthand. And then we also have on April 30th, the property assessment appeal board deadline. This is the deadline to file to the more formalized board of appeal typically written submissions and uh, appeal management conferences to settle values. And then of course, uh, midsummer is our all important July 1st valuation date. So what was your property worth on or around July 1st each year? As we get into the fall, feverish pitch mounts once again, uh, we get into role production. We look at this physical condition of permitted use of a property as of October the 31st. So that might be a partially complete um, property or, or how it, its um, permitted use is by your local bylaws. Um, November 30th, ownership as of um, um, per land title survey authority as of November 30th will appear on the assessment roll. Assessment notices produced and mailed and December 31st, um, those on the roll are liable for the taxation that appears on the annual assessment roll. So um, the next two slides are, what are our appraisers are talking about right now uh, to our general public when they call in and they, they talk about increases. So we, we generate the assessed value and then from that tax base that is provided to our local governments, they set the mill rates to generate those taxes and it equates to property taxes payable. So um, that's something that we, we really needed to um, step back and uh, communicate clearly this year to property owners because there was a lot of sticker shock, as you may have heard already, around assessed value changes throughout Vancouver Island and the province of BC. And this, this graphic appears on every assessment notice that goes out. Um, it's very important to understand that if your assessed value increases, um, that, um, but it's similar to everybody else in your, in your jurisdiction, your taxes likely do not change in a perfect world where there's maybe no major infrastructure or monies needed by the local governments for whatever reason. If it's lower than the average change of the property class, your taxes may likely go down. Uh, higher than average change means your taxes may, may increase greater than the rest of, of everybody else. One of the simple, simple explanations that I, 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 I give to family and friends or even the property owners at call you got to think about, say, class one, which is 80% of our, our properties on Vancouver Island. As that base increases, then the to get to, to Y or, or to Z, your, your final value for your budget, your, your tax rate can typically shrink. So I, I try to break it down a little bit for them uh, in terms of understanding that a 30% increase doesn't mean a 30% increase in your taxes. And I'm starting to see that message conveyed more and more through the media. I had interviews with the CBC radio and CBC television, Nanaimo Daily News, Times Colonist this year. And the media are starting to pick up on this as well, which is good because it takes a long time to get that, that message out there. So I'm glad it's, it's finally uh, sinking. And realtors too are speaking to the same thing, which is, is good for us. Maurice, would you take a question on that? Uh, we have one in the. Oh, no, for later. Sure. Gonna... Okay. Oh, sorry. Director, we will ask one later. He's, he's in the queue. So go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we can do questions at the end. Just, just make sure you note them down for me, please. Um, okay. Um, so now this is what everyone's been waiting for. Um, the assessment role for the, um, oh, that's, that's an error on my part. I should say 2022. So sorry about that. Um, the 2022 com completed provincial role highlights. Some of these numbers are staggering. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, last year's total value of the assessment role was around 2.1 trillion. Now it's 2.44 trillion, up 22%. The highest increase in the total value of the assessment role in BC assessments history. Um, Non-market change, another significant increase this year with all the new construction subdivisions and development that's been going on in our, in our province are up about 53%. Um, total residential value is up a staggering 88% this year. Um, that's due to, um, that's due primarily to market. 
Total, total properties assessed for 2022, 2.1 uh, million, as I mentioned before, and that's an increase of 1.2% over last year. So as you can see, uh, you know, before we went to close the rule this year, we stood back and went, wow, this is unheard of. This is unprecedented. And um, it, we, it really helped us to prepare for what we're going through now in the, in the first quarter of answering the inquiries and getting ready for the appeal season. Now, if we look to the Comox Valley Regional District, I pulled some numbers here, and this is how this is how it went down in the Comox Valley this year. Um, property minor increase in the number of properties added to the assessment rule this year. Um, let me see. I think I wrote it down there. No, I didn't write down the folio count. It wasn't very much this year. Um, increase from the 2021 rolls up 22 percent. Um, an increase in non-market change is up a healthy 15%. So uh, in 2021, uh, we're over here, non-market change was 3.75 million. So it's up to 432 million this year. And uh, market was about a 5% increase last year and just over 22% this year. So quite, a, quite an increase. And again, uh, the Comox Valley Regional District is no different than anywhere else on Vancouver Island. Or, or provincially, um, provincially we saw a rise of 15 to 30, 35 percent across the board, at least. So for the city of Courtney, these are the typical changes, uh, benchmark changes that we've seen this year on the 2022 assessment roll. A single-family dwelling is up about 35 percent. Uh, residential strata is up about 30 percent. Commercial 10 percent. NMC is at 212 million, roughly. Um, let's see here. Last year, the change was 7% for single family dwelling, 5% for strata, uh, 2.46 for um, um, non-market non -market change. So that was slightly down for the, for the city of Courtney. Oh, and um, uh, commercial properties were down 3% last year, minus 3% versus 10% of this year. Uh, this year, uh, just to put the single family dwellings in a little bit of perspective, in the city of Courtney proper alone in 2020, 2021, um, oh, sorry, in the, for the 2021 role in 2020, we had 176 sales. This last year we had 587, quite a few sales to rely upon to set the annual assessment role, which is good because I wouldn't wanna increase 35% and have no market evidence for that. So we've got a lot of evidence this year that shows us where we needed to land. For the town of Comox, very similar numbers. Uh, residential single family up 35% uh, was 6% last year. Uh, residential strata 27% was 1% last year. Commercial properties up 12% this year were down 2% last year. Uh, Non-market change for the town of Com Comox grew quite a bit this year. Last year was 35.4 million. This year it's 96 million. So again, quite staggering increases across the board in the neighboring town of Comox. Now we move on to Cumberland. Um, and uh, we again see some pretty incredible uh, numbers for market movement this year. Uh, residential single family dwellings up 38%. Uh, residential stratus 28%. Oh, sorry, I forgot to re recall. In residential in, in uh, Cumberland last year was 6%. Now it's 38%. Strata is 28 last year, it was 6% again, uh, as same as residential. Commercial 18.5%, and in the previous year it was 1%. Um, total NMC for the town of Cumberland, uh, 25.2 million. Last year it was 19.5 million. I can attest to it. I've been in Cumberland. I spent some time there this, this last year, uh, made a few family trips up there. And I, and I was overwhelmed by how busy that community can be on a weekend. And then too, looking at the real estate values, um, you know, sales and listings in, in the neighborhood, I was quite impressed. To me, it, it appears to be like the next new little Whistler, but uh, in, in, in terms of mountain biking and, and uh, lake activities. So I, it, this doesn't really surprise me in that sense, based on seeing it on the ground when I was there. So now we're going to break out into the uh, three electoral areas. Sorry. Electoral uh, area A, we saw some similar increases as, as we have through um, Courtney Comox and Cumberland. 
41% residential, 27% strata, 15% commercial. Uh, in 2021, single family was 8%. Uh, residential strata was 20, uh, was 16%. Now it's 27%. Commercial was static at zero change. This year it's 15%. Uh, total NMC, 24 million, uh, up slightly from last year at 22.1 million. Now I've been specifically asked to break out what's gone on with Denman and Hornby Islands this year. And I'll tell you, it's been a very busy market in those two uh, islands as well. So first we're gonna start with uh, Denman Island. So this year we had 24 upland sales, nine waterfront sales. And I believe the number last year, I forgot to write it down, was around 12. So we're almost uh, you know, three times the amount of sales that we've had on those areas. Residential change, 40 to 60% and 80% of the um, in in 80% uh, of the folios on Denman Island. The median residential sale price in 2021 is $808,000. This speaks to around 800 residential folios um, on uh, Denman Island. Um, I had a, a discussion with. Um, um, her first name is Miss Tooley. She's a real estate agent over uh, in Hornby and Gulf Islands. And um, she was telling me, she says, this year was an unprecedented year uh, in that, like in that, in the height of summer, there was almost no listings available. And as of, and when I looked on MLS uh, Friday, there were three active listings on the entire island. There is nothing available to purchase. And as we know, when there's nothing to purchase, and there is a demand for property that the values and the prices that paid will go quite high. Now what's with this bar chart, so the gaps in the chart indicate quarters where we haven't had any sales. Where, and, the, and the red lines represent July 1st. So, oops, I have a pointer here. So these are your July 1st lines. And this down here, I'm sorry, the font is small, but I did send Kevin the presentation so he can share that with you. 2020, at the end of 2020, we started seeing an uptick. This is one. So this is where our assessments are for the previous year, right here. And this sales to assessment ratio sh uh, shows you in different, in 20 degree increments, where the purchase prices landed for 2021. And that will take us into setting the 2022 rule. As you can see in the first quarter, we were sitting at about 1.3 or 30% increase to up here, which is two. So almost 100% increase in some properties. Very small amount, but typical 30 plus increases on Denman, uh, Denman Island. Sorry, I keep saying Hornby. It's the next slide I'm referring to. So on Denman Island. Now Hornby, this is an interesting one as well. We had 16 upland sales, 14 waterfront sales, Residential change, similar to Denman Island, 40 to 60% for 75% of the folios. Median residential price, 1.2 versus the 808. Uh, I believe it was 808 from the last slide. Again, when we look at the sale to assessment, so keep in mind, so assessments are here are at one for the previous year. And then these are the sale prices that have occurred on Hornby Island in 2021. Uh, uh, what was it? Oh, uh, Donna Tooley. Sorry, that, that's her name. The realtor that works on Denman Hornby Island. In our conversation, she says, uh, in, in around 2009, we would have 50 to 60 listings on the island. Um, carrying on about another five or six years, we sort of started to see a decline in listings, 20 to 25 a year. The height of summer 2021, there were six active listings on Hornby Island, and that's all. As of yes, as of the other day, there were zero active listings on Hornby Island when I looked on Friday in the realtor.ca or MLS by Red. And she says, usually this time of year, there's about 10 active listings. So again, it just goes to show that there's been quite a severe demand for these properties on Denman and Hornby this year for, I'm gonna say for whatever reason, the, the desire is to move or have a recreational property or relocate. Um, this has been the demand this year. It's been staggering and, and no area was really left 
uh, exempt from any sort of increase. When we move to electoral area B, we see again, quite some substantive increases that have occurred. Uh, single family is up 45% from 4% in 2021. Residential strata is just about 30% when it was 3% previously in previous years. Commercial uh, is up 36%, um, was 5% the year previous. Uh, Non-market change this year is about 49.6 million, where, whereby it was about 23.9 million uh, last year. So growth in both non-market and market. Um, and finally, electoral area C, again, similar increases, 43% single family, 5% last year, 41% uh, strata, 9% last year, commercial 19% this year, 1%, <clears throat> excuse me, last year. Uh, NMC is slightly lower at 25.2 million from 28.1 million last year. Now, thinking of all this, um, I tried to put a slide together to talk about what went on. Um, I've talked to a lot of realtors. I've given uh, presentations um, to various real estate groups on Vancouver Island, Vancouver Island Real Estate Board, um, Sims Real Estate Group, Remax. Uh, I talked to a couple of family members who were realtors. Um, there's been an extremely, if you haven't read the news or seen the media, there's been extremely high demand for inventory on Vancouver Island and very limited, limited supply. Bidding wars are super common. We can be speculating here, you know, maybe it's the advent of being able to work from any, any location and not be a day trader in Vancouver. You could take that job, you could go to Qualcomm, you could go to Zabalis, or you could do whatever you want. The North Island has been affordable. And we started seeing this trend last year when I was speaking to, to local governments in um, the North Island, particularly Tassis and Gold River. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. They were, they were yelling at me. They were upset. You know, we can't have this. We can't have this. And when I started talking about some of the changes that were happening in communities, you know, Coast, Coast Connect, the fiber optics, uh, new Coast Guard station, uh, grants for the new road going into Tassis, uh, money for a new civic center. Um, yeah, on the Coast Guard station. Um, you know, so there's lots of attractive things happening. There's communities are growing, they're developing, and that's what we want to see is growth and development. Now people are starting to wake up to that and they're buying these properties that were low value before. Um, there was almost a 75% increase in the volume of single family dwelling sales across Vancouver Island this year. Typically, when I set an assessment role, I have about 8,000 arm arm's length transactions that I rely on for my team to set the residential role. This year, we had almost 14,000. It was staggering. It was, the, the amount of work was unbelievable to get through them all to set the role. That's how much volume we've seen on Vancouver Island. And for the first time this year, we've had over 1,000 SFD sales over a million dollars. That includes nothing south of Malahat, nothing in the capital region. That's just north of our Malahat. And apparently that number before, the one realtor told me, he says, if we had, if we had a, a couple sales a month over a million dollars in Nanaimo, it was unbelievable. Now they're getting 15, 16, 20 sales a month over the peak of the real estate period this year, over a million dollars. Um, and uh, the, the market movement on Vancouver Island uh, is commensurate with the rest of the province at 15 to 35%. Now, uh, here's another graph to show you the uh, sale to assessment ratio. It says Courtney, but it is the Comox Valley Regional District. And you can see here we are at one again. This is July 2018, July 1st, 2018, July 1st, 2019. We started seeing this uh, occur last year when I was hearing from local government saying, you've you know, I think you can remember the news with Tassis and Gold River going up quite uh, exponentially last year. And then it's just simply climbed up. And there's the end of the fourth quarter, 2021, sitting at about 1.45% or 45% increase. So these graphs, this, th these graphs show the, the sales that have occurred in the marketplace for single family dwellings in the Comox Valley Regional District and translate into the increases that you've seen. Um, can't forget our friend, uh, business and other class six, um, I, it, also for, uh, in, uh, commercial properties, uh, changes have been anywhere from 15 to 35%. 
um, assessment values driven by market demand and income activity. We've seen a lot of demand for things like industrial warehousing, um, vacant industrial lands across the island, um, notably actually in the mid island around Coombs and Arrington, it's been quite strong. Um, we've seen economic recovery with properties on, on Vancouver Island, changes in use, uh, thinking differently about uh, how to utilize the property or, or get its max, maximal highest and best use out of that particular land. Um, and, but we have to remember that changes in a, in a property assessment really, especially with ICNI properties, depend on the property type and the location. So quite a busy year for all of us at BC Assessment. So um, I just wanna go through this. Um, this will be important information for um, your citizens. Uh, we talked about the inquiry period again, uh, Monday, January 31st, midnight, 11.59 p.m. is the deadline to file your appeal. If you're gonna send in a letter, it must be postmarked before the end of Monday, uh, or if it's electronic, time stamped for uh, that period. Then we're gonna move into the um, appeal process, which will take us to mid-March. And then we're gonna produce your role, your revised role, and then uh, next level of appeal is what's next on the books. So I don't think I had anything else. Um, uh, just, you know, given the, the, the volume of appeals we may see and um, the, 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 the mood of the taxpayer, I just want to remind everyone that the property assessment review panel and the property assessment appeal board are appointed by provincial government and are independent of BC assessment and taxing jurisdictions. Decisions will be based on a review of evidence presented available at the hearing and the PAB decisions can also be appealed to the BC Supreme Court or the BC Court of Appeal on questions of law. A lot of information there. A couple of takeaways. I really, really, really encourage uh, taxpayers to go to our website. Every year there's changes made to it that make it better and better. Um, we have an assessment search tool. Look up your address, compare it to other addresses on your street, click on a property and find out what it was assessed for. Look at the sales in your neighborhood, create a profile, save all that information if you're gonna go to appeal. It's very easy to print out and produce and present at the property assessment review panel. There's property information and trends, you can look at breakdowns for all for most all property classes in most jurisdictions across BC through our interactive maps. Just hover your arrow over there and it'll show you all the breakdown that has occurred in that area. Information pages, everything from farming to managed forest to utilities. There's tons of information pages. You can file your appeal through our website. You can do an address change through our website. You can, you can access your um, assessment link BC, your portal to your, to your assessment data for local governments through our website. Um, no, sorry, data advice, yeah, assessment like BC. Um, you can submit information through the standard building uh, permit report. Um, some of you know it as Citrix Fair share file um, and service boundary web maps. There's tons of information. I highly recommend if you have not explored, take five minutes one evening and go through it. I think you'll be quite impressed with what you see. Now I'll be quiet and I'll listen to you. Thank you very much for hearing my presentation. Thanks so much, Maurice. Um, there's questions, so um, I'm gonna to go to Director Arbor first. Sorry. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Primo, for another good presentation this year, and I very much appreciated um, that you broke down the Hornby and Denman figures. Um, I'll make a couple of um, statement and then some, some questions, perhaps. Um, sure. One is, on, on the bigger picture, politically speaking, um, if we are not in a bubble, and um, and the trend continues, and I think for Vancouver Island, it, we may not be in a bubble. Um, I think we're at the stage where we need major interventions from the provincial and federal governments in terms of the the values of property in the market, the housing market in Canada. Um, that is probably one of the most skewed in the world right now. We are decimating the opportunity of our youth, of our children, to get into the market. And, uh, and, and, and it's just unacceptable, generally speaking. Um, so that's number one. On, on the more local level, you know, I guess there's two things that I hear from people. One is, is that first one I talked about. The second is really um, 
you know, the, the trend that has existed in the rural areas of the Comox Valley for the last three years, and I've raised it every year, and Ken and others will recall that I used to make a fuss because Hornby and Denman and the part of area were maybe, you know, growing at 4% more than the rest of the valley. Uh, this year, when we them at 55% compared to 30% in the municipalities, I calculated on the napkin, of course, because I don't do the, the really detailed work, that this could translate for each island to about half a million contribution to the regional functions more than last year, right? And people don't see more services for that. So some of the questions I hear is first, I, I really appreciate, by the way, I don't know if it was the first year that you had it, you had the map um, that broke, you know, people can search and then you can actually look by neighborhoods, which is how I first found out about Hornby and Denman. But then you, in your presentation, you talked about how, how in a way there were so few sales and those few sales, you know, affect and are represented to the entire class of residents that will end up taking up a bigger share of the pie in a region. And so people would love, well, I have a very small request. One is to maybe, it's been what you did today, but if that could be available on the website, including the map tool, if we could see the rationale for, or, or some qualifier or commentary as to how BC assessment goes from a handful of sales to apply it to 2000 properties. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, your professional, so I trust is there, but people do end up thinking that maybe, you know, to the average resident, it all seems like voodoo magic. And, and I think that it's really good what you did today to present the trends in that. And it'd be great to have that available on the BC assessment website when people look at their neighborhoods and communities. Um, so obviously a lot of my comments are not directed at, um, necessarily at BC assessment, but the impact both on the next generation and also on the fairness and the equity across the region is concerning, you know, uh, and that's that's debates that will go through the budget process. Um, so I, I thank you for your work. I think, uh, again, I think it's you, you did a great job uh, presenting some of the trends we're dealing with. My last question, maybe and the only question is, uh, is there any alternative methods of evaluation that BC assessment has considered or or is the model that's being employed, you think, is, is top of class and is our only alternative? Um, okay, so I'll just speak a little bit to your first comments. Um, when I looked and when, when I showed you that slide on the residential, the volume of sales that we dealt with this year, it was astronomical. It was unprecedented. We've never had that many residential sales on the, on the books to set the assessment role. Just I'm going to just speak to single family. Um, so it, it, it provided a lot of evidence for us to do what we do by the Assessment Act and its report market activity as of July 1st. You know, it's, it's regrettable that the, that the, that the market, um, uh, you know, went up so much. And there are citizens of the Hornby and Denman Islands that have been there for a long time, and they're probably going like this. I understand. I get it. I'm, I'm empathetic towards it. I, my assessment went up a lot in Nanaimo as well. However, we don't create the market, we only report it. And, and talking to realtors, like I said, the Sims Real Estate Group, Remax, and some family members who are realtors, they have just been absolutely blown away by the activity that's been on, going on in the market. And we've had many, many round table discussions within our organization of what, like just, are these real? What are you seeing in Columbia Kootenays? What are you seeing in the Okanagan? This, is, this has been happening across the board. And it's unfortunate that the buyers are paying what they're paying. You know, there's some outlier purchases that we don't put heavy weight and consideration on. You know, we try to look at the median, what's been going on in a marketplace before we set the role. But this is what has come out for these two islands in the past. And then again, talking to Ms. Tooley, the realtor, she says it's been unprecedented what's been going on in the marketplace in the Gulf Islands. Um, what did I want to speak to? Mass appraisal. So we, we, we apply mass appraisal uh, valuation principles when valuing all of our residential properties uh, in BC. So we look at what's happening in a cluster. So Denman is different than Hornby, is different than Courtney. So we look in those clusters 
and we see what's happened in the marketplace and we try to as fairly as possible and equitably as possible apply the change to the other properties on the island. The land is primarily what drives a lot of that value. Um, alternative methods of valuation, not that I have heard of. Um, there are different methods of doing valuation. I've heard of in other na nations, like um, I believe it's the UK, they have assessment bans. So how far you are out from an urban core um, can determine your assessment. I know Nova Scotia has caps on increases. That currently it doesn't exist in the Assessment Act. There's no caps, there's no bans. So we report the market. And unfortunately, in some cases like this year, it's been sticker shock for a lot of people. Did I miss any points or I want to make sure I cover everything. If, if I can answer a question for you today, I will take it away and, and share the response for Kevin to share outward to this group. So good. I, I just want to say thank you for that additional information and insights. And, and you can be sure that I'll be uh, re researching caps and bands and <laughs> let's see how, what kind of alternative models exist out there. Thank you so much for coming in early and, and explain these things to us. Always my pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Director Arger. I don't see any other questions from in. Oh, we have one from Director Hillian. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Maurice. Uh, good to see you again. Forgive thank me you. if I've asked this question before, but um, I'm wondering if you can clarify how uh, you um, um, differentiate the uh, the value uh, ascribed to land versus the buildings that are on that land. Uh, since, as far as I know, you never actually enter the houses. You're just taking a look at them from outside. Uh, so I'd be interested to know how you actually make that differentiation. Okay. So um, when we set the annual assessment role, we first look at uh, vacant land sales that have happened in a marketplace. And that gives us the found foundation, sorry, no pun intended, but it gives us a, a basis for which to set the land values um, in, in a particular area or a jurisdiction. And then we look at the sale price, you know, sale prices for vacant properties, and we look at the sale prices for improved properties. All improved properties have um, are, are valued based on different parameters, such as square footage, the type of finish. You know, it could be a Genish cust, uh, basic home, or it could, it could be like a, a pheasant homes custom built, um, you know, architecturally designed uh, building. And we have cost factors that apply to, to both properties. Uh, square footage, um, number of stories. Um, we look at um, uh, uh, depreciation. So every property will then have a depreciation curve applied to it. Um, and what we try to do in mass appraisal is we try to group similar classes of properties together. So the Janish plans, the pheasant home plan homes, group those together or the old 1940 BC boxes, we, we like to call them. They get grouped together as, as, as a lump. And then we look at all the sales activity that have happened in that lump. When we then uh, go to set the improvement values, we look at, okay, so this, this group of one, uh, we'll call it 140 in, in my lingo, sorry for the lingo, uh, like a 1970s built BC box that's got, you know, like a carport, maybe enclosed in a garage, maybe a thousand over 800 or a thousand over 700 square feet. We group all those together. And then we look at what the sales in the marketplace were telling we need to take the land value and elevate slightly higher to bring us an improvement value to meet the assessment to sales ratio of roughly 98% of the sale price. Okay, yeah, that, that's kind of what I expected. Uh, so if there is uh, virtually no bare land in a neighborhood um, uh, and you can't really assess what's happening with uh, land prices, uh, you, you look at, a, at the larger area and uh, ascribe the value in that way. Do you? Yeah, and and we look at we look at we look at sales, and there was quite a few of them of just sales of uh, sales of vacant land. There were quite a few of those this year, and then sales of improved properties that have a very de minimis value attributed to the improvement. Um, you know, the improvement value is probably the cost of demolition applied to it. So we have a couple sources that we can go to to help set the land. Um, if for some unknown reason, and we haven't seen it this year. Uh, there, there was, say, zero vacant sales. We'd look to something homogenous that's adjacent or um, like a reference jurisdiction, something very, very close. Uh, but we got to tread very carefully when we do that because we know that location, location, location will determine what a buyer is willing to pay for a particular property. So we got to be very, excuse me, careful when we do that. But there are methods and ways to, to determine a land value outside of vacant land sales, yes. 
Yeah, thanks. And I would certainly echo some of uh, Director Arbor's earlier comments about um, uh, how we uh, uh, how we uh, respond to this as a as a societal issue. Um, you know, the the only way uh, the market is going to uh, lower the price of houses is if the supply uh, increases uh, by some amazing factor, um, which uh, puts our our plans for increased density and compact growth. Uh, um, in, in some jeopardy, uh, you know, and we're, we're faced with a choice of uh, either uh, sprawl development uh, or uh, which would despoil our environment or uh, seeing these sorts of trends continue. And uh, I know that um, you don't have any solutions to that, but I, I would certainly echo the call that uh, we need to, uh, as a society, find, um, find an answer to this. Thank you. You know, um, Councillor Hillian, I have to agree with you. It's, it's been, you know, these conversations happen at, at my business level. They happen at my family level. How are my nieces and nephews going to afford to get into the marketplace? What is our, what are, what are our, our, our leading governments doing to get in front of this? What are our national governments doing to get in front of this? I hate to report, but I'm still seeing some incredible sale prices come through the marketplace in January, which is typically a very quiet month. I've already seen, and if my numbers are correct, going from memory, just looking a couple of days ago, I've got over 850 residential sales on Bank of Brown that have only occurred in the month of January. It's absolutely incredible. I don't know where the money is coming from, to be honest. Um, I don't know how people can afford these values. My fear is that they're not going to be able to afford them in the future. Something is going to change eventually. We will get to a point of saturation, I feel, and this is a bit speculative, so we got to take it with a grain of salt. Vancouver Island is a very desirable destination, a very incredible place to be. I enjoyed my time in Cumberland. I didn't stay very long. It was so busy, but I really enjoy the North Island. I was camping up at Vernon Lake this year near Wass. I quite loved it. It's a beautiful place to be, um, and people are discovering that. They don't want to be in the big urban centers any longer. If they can get a piece of real estate and move their family to a place they can still work, educate, live, and grow their families in a community that's growing or showing promise, they will do that. So I think we're in it for a little while. I have no crystal ball. It's, but, you know, I, I kind of see things still um, moving this, moving in this direction. Um, I'm, I'm not, I can't say to this degree, but I'm seeing values still, the sale prices are, are above the ass ass uh, assessed values, it's even in January when I preliminary looked at some some market information this year. Well, um, uh, just as a final comment, if you'll indulge me, Chair, it doesn't escape me that the most massive increases have taken place uh, during these last two years when we've been uh, experienced, uh, experiencing the pandemic. And um, I think initially Vancouver Island was uh, perceived as being a lot safer than uh, other parts of the province and that uh, likely played on the demand as well. Um, anyway, thanks very much. My pleasure, always. Director Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is, uh, does Maurice have a uh, security detail? <laughs> well, I, I hope the day would never come that I had to think about that. Um, you know what, I have to report quite happily. Uh, we've experienced a higher than normal call volume this year, inquiries uh, around the assessed values. Um, I haven't got final appeal stats, so I, I cannot share what, what isn't complete yet. But what I am seeing, uh, or what I'm hearing, uh, talking to property owners, is that, um, you know, they've heard it. They heard the, the, the rumble that the, the values are going up, the, you know, the benchmarks, like, you know, Qualicum is now, uh, what was it, uh, 808000 is the benchmark price for a home in Oceanside. Um, you know, Victoria, now the standard is 1.1. They've heard the news. They've now they're opening their notices. Um, they, they heard the media, as I was talking earlier, I've, I've gotten in front of CBC times colonists and I want daily news, um, lots of different publications and BC assessment. I've really got in front of it as well too, with our media releases to try to tell everybody, this is really what's happening in the marketplace. And again, I have to iterate, we don't create the market. We need to report it. So how best do we tell people that this is what's really happening? And this is what you're going to see on your assessment notice. I have to say quite pleasantly and surprised, the majority of the callers are understanding and they just appreciate the fact that we've taken a few minutes to explain what's happened in their community. Uh, maybe 
provide some comparable sales, and for the most part, have been quite pleasant to work with and, and to hear the reactions. Of course, there, not all callers are like that. There's some uh, rather upset callers, and I, I totally appreciate that. But for the most part, we're seeing, yes, it's high. We understand it's sticker shock, but we get what you're saying. So there has been acceptance to a degree. So it's for that. Nice from our side. Um, so I hope I don't need that security detail anytime soon. Uh, from the busy Cumberland alternative director, Sullivan. I yeah, just uh, wanted to end, Maurice, with, um, I know you guys just report, but if you could stop reporting that Cumberland is the new whistler, we would really enjoy people. <laughs> that's my personal, uh, that's just. <laughs> <laughs> it actually gets pretty quiet at night, but my house went up 46% uh, this year. So it's, it's tricky times around these parts. Yeah, I remember, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm apologizing, apologizing. I forget her name, the mayor of Cumberland. I met with her earlier in the summer and she was telling me that she had somebody approach her to, and offered her a million dollars for her home. She says, it's not all that. But they offered her a million dollars for her property. She's got a pretty, a pretty nice house. Yeah. Oh, Mayor, she? I don't know. <laughs> Mayor Baird. Well, every, all the houses are pretty nice here, but um, well, you, you know, I have to say growing up on Vancouver Island, I moved to Parksville in 1975 when I was five and it was unincorporated. Uh, the Island has greatly changed. I I've traveled the world and I've lived here my whole life. This place has really changed in the last 30, 40 years. I just can't believe it from being a kid to today where it's at and trying to figure out where it might be going. It's, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll share something with you. Um, uh, you know, I've, I'm thinking about retirement in a few years and I'm looking to the North Island, but I'm also standing back going, if I don't do it now, I'm not going to do it at all because I'm not gonna be able to afford it any longer. And I think the North Island is beautiful. So myself and hundreds of others are thinking the same way. So, and you've got a great little community in Cumberland. It's got all the great little amenities and then the recreation, it's, it's quite attractive. I think we're, we're, we're trying to stop saying that. We, no, no, yeah, no sorry. That. Yeah, <laughs> in my voice. Well, we don't want another 40%, 46% next year. So. Uh, I, I don't think I could live through another increase like this. Um, I hope it doesn't come to this. I really, truly don't. It's very um, unsustainable. Most we have a question from Director Grant, and I think then I'll, I'll wrap it up because I know we've, we've had a pretty fulsome discussion. Thank you. So hopefully this will be a, a quick one, but Maurice, I know your tax rolls um, go to July 1st, 2021. And of course, that puts them six months behind some of the sales we're seeing. So I'm wondering when you show that graph of prices of houses selling for more, how much of it is attributed to the fact that your price is six months behind today's? There's been dramatic increases in the last six months of this year. So just wondering if that has any effect. Uh, no, well, not really because we cut off uh, January 1st to July, or January 1st to December 31st sales that go into the pot for analysis. So that graph only demonstrates sales that have occurred in that particular quarter. And then we don't look outside of the year if I'm answering your question correctly. So um, that was just basically a distribution graph of um, what the sales did for the most part, the median sale price in first, second, and third, fourth quarter of 2020. Um, but overall, we look at the whole pot of sales you know, um, you know, some of the lower end ones and some of the higher end ones might be outliers. You know, we get some sales that come through at 300,000 over ask. It's absolutely mind boggling. But do we include that in the mix? No. Is that a typical market transaction? No. So that graph just gives you the raw dirt of the sales to assessment ratio. Um, you know, the increases we have, we've seen are not 100%, but there are some that are a little bit lower. Um, yeah, it sounds to me as though we could be looking at a fairly big increase next year then too, if that's the way you're doing it. Um, I'm seeing increases of our assessed values currently, and, but we're still early days. It's still January. Um, it'll be hard to say where we're going to be in the summertime once maybe interest rates change, if they'll bring a little bit of a cooling to the marketplace. But right now it's still going up quite a bit. Case in point, I think my home was assessed at around 800,000. I went up 250,000 this year. Um, houses on my street are selling at 860, 870, almost 900,000 now. And it's January. 
It's absolutely incredible. Thanks for that, Maurice. I think, um, and I thank the, the directors for the fulsome discussion. I'm glad to hear that folks are thinking about um, what, what options we have as a community and the impacts that these, um, the raises are having on, on community. Um, so that presentation is um, just for receipt. Uh, anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's, uh, that's carried. And thank you, Maurice, for coming again. Yeah, if I can make one recommendation, mm -hmm. um, actively participate in your UBCM and uh, have some conversations with your other local governments in BC. We're seeing this everywhere and you know, maybe some conversations could spur some changes to what our provincial government does down the road, but I can't speak to that, but you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, thank you, okay. Lots of, there's nods, thank you. Okay, have a nice evening, thank you everybody. You too. Bye for now. Item number two on reports, the 2022-2026 proposed financial plan for receipt. Moved and seconded. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors. And Kevin Duvell, our Manager of Financial Planning, is on the line and will introduce to you the financial planning process for this year. He will provide a summary of the overall consolidated budget and how it looks across our services and for you, the participants in those services. Kevin then will go on to present the initial budgets for municipal administration, general government, electoral area administration, and the member municipality debt. So I welcome Kevin. Uh, you may have questions that uh, Kevin will um, refer to some of our other managers to assist you to understand where the overall consolidated budget is and the specifics of the four budgets as presented. Thanks. Over to Kevin. Thank you very much. Through the CAO to the chair, good afternoon, directors. So yes, it is that time of year again when staff are here to present to you the 2022-2026 proposed financial plan and capital expenditure program. So I'm just going to see if I can share my screen here. Is everyone able to see the yep. title page of this presentation? It's up, thank you. Great, thank you. So yes, um, as Russell said, I'm here today to present the, starting with the consolidated uh, overview of the financial plan. And then, yeah, we will move on to some of the uh, general administration or administration type budgets uh, today. And then as I get into this, uh, presentation, I'll also kind of speak to you around what the anticipated process is uh, over the next several weeks as we roll out our financial plan. So directors first set the strategic priorities for the regional district in October of 2019, and at that time affirmed four strategic drivers and eight core service areas for the organization in an effort to meet the ever-evolving needs of the communities within our region. And I'll speak to each of those things separately in, in a few slides from now. The proposed 2022-2026 uh, uh, financial plans that will be rolled out to you over the next approximately eight weeks continue to incorporate those drivers once again uh, as ongoing lenses. And we'll, we will speak to each of how each of those services are achieving, meeting or exceeding one or more of those uh, strategic drivers or, or core service deliveries as we go forward. The theme of this year's budget process, which is outlined on, on the kind of the title screen there, celebrating accomplishments while continuing to plan for long-term sustainability in uncertain times, was conceived partly by a, a recent board meeting. So I thank the board for that uh, as of a bit of inspiration, but it was also kind of conceived as we moved into a local government election year. And while we also continue navigating through the uncertainty and challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, as I noted last year, the shape and reflection of an organization's culture, values, and priorities should always be illustrated within its financial plans, whether intentionally, which of course is preferable, or otherwise. This is because an organization's financial plan ultimately tells the story of what we as an organization intend to do, how we intend to do it, when we intend to do it, and why we intend to do it. The financial plans for the now 101 uh, CVRD services to be presented to you as part of this annual financial planning process will hopefully show that we are continuing to work towards ensuring there are strong and clear linkages between our strategic drivers, our financial planning, sustainable service delivery, and ultimately our annual financial reporting. With that in mind, I would like to offer the board the following food for thought for this year. First, revenues will continue to be difficult to predict for some of our services, most notably planning, recreation, solid waste, and transit. 
Two, supply chain uncertainties will continue to impact both the operational and capital sides of our financial plan. Thirdly, for a number of our services, budget scenarios have landed on best guess or most likely scenarios. Of course, bookended by a look at both best and worst case scenarios in order to ensure fiscal prudence when we're, we're putting together our financial plans. And lastly, I just want to assure the board that as staff and particularly within finance, we're also always watching what the story is telling us, whether that's cash flow, debt, grants, reserve and surplus planning, planning rather, as part of solid fiscal management, as those are all very important to be keeping an eye on. As in previous years, time will be provided at the end of this presentation for questions and answers. However, if uh, any questions do arise during the presentation, please, by all means, let me know. If further information is needed to be gathered to fully respond to questions, of course, staff will endeavor to report back to you at a, a subsequent meeting. Hopefully all questions you may have will be answered over the course of the next two presentations that I'll be providing on behalf of our senior management team and certainly on behalf of the 24 plus uh, budget managers that I work with exclusively over the course of every year. The various CDRD committees and commissions will as normal be presented with staff reports and presentations focused on those budget uh, areas and services that fall under their respective purviews. And as always, time will be provided for questions and uh, will be continued to be received and responded in as timely manner as possible. The decisions and recommendations that flow out of those various sessions over the next eight weeks will shape the next stage of the annual uh, budget process, being the recommended financial plan. Staff reports uh, this year particularly, uh, we have strived to make those more concise and streamlined and where appropriate consolidated for some similar services. I don't know. Bear with me one second. There we go. So what you're seeing in front of you is a bit of a schematic on our annual financial planning process. This schematic was actually first developed in 2019 and continues to evolve. Though this latest position was just recently, or was posted actually for the first time last year to our financial planning page and the CDRD website. And starting last year, we also did produce a short video presentation of the process, which again has been included and updated for 2022. Our annual financial planning, of course, is an ongoing cycle of reflection, challenging assumptions, rethinking and renewal. And particularly during COVID, that you know, was absolutely the case. The short two minute video I just mentioned will illustrate the financial planning process and explain how the public can engage and explain any changes or updates going into 2022. So this slide um, does need to be updated slightly, but it, it's pretty representative of where we're at right now. So as I mentioned earlier, the total number of services for 2022 is now 101. That's versus 98 services in 2021. This year, that includes a number of new services, such as our Tar Saratoga Beach Mosquito Management Service and our Denman Hornby Islands Internet Connectivity Service. Of course, as the board is aware, we also took on three new services resulting from the conversion of the former Union Bay Improvement District. And as board, board members will hear, we also did a, number, a bit of restructuring with some of our bylaw services within the rural areas. To give everyone a sense of what the updated service counts by participant are for 2022, Courtney remains the same as the illustration suggests at 23. Courtney, or sorry, Comox also remains the same at 22. Cumberland's down slightly at 18. And then with respect to the electoral areas, area A continues to be at 67 services provided with area Bs and, and C both ending up at about 46. And some of that is just the resulting of the ebbs and flows of the number of services that we deliver. Of course, many of these services are legislated or mandated services we provide, such as the aforementioned admin and general government, member municipality administration and electoral area administration. 
We also provide a number of servants to a variety of participants in multiple combinations or service areas. Some of our services, as you know, are Comox Valley wide. Some may include just the main island portion, so excluding them in Hornby Islands. Some may be delivered to one or more municipalities, such as our sewage service, which is delivered to Courtney Comox, and then various combinations thereof. So the message here is that unlike municipalities, regional districts don't have a single taxpayer base. We actually have multiple taxpayer bases. Come on, there we go. So what this slide illustrates, as the board is aware, is the strategic drivers for the organization. These four strategic drivers influence and are reflected in each of our core service areas being electoral areas, finance and administration, regional emergency programs, recreation, regional growth strategy, transportation, sewage management, and of course, water supply. These drivers were reaffirmed by the board in its 2021 strategic planning process and staff developments of the 101 draft budgets will ultimately reflect these. Come on. There we go. So there continues to be numerous competing demands and pressures exerted on local government. The ongoing effort is to find that so-called sweet spot when considering the services we deliver, the current and projected economic, environmental, and organizational capacity, all when facing influencers such as, as Morris Primo alluded to, assess values, in addition to regulatory and legislative considerations population growth, citizen expectations and perception of values received, funding availability, and of course, the big one over the last two years being COVID-19. So as the slide suggests, Rethink Comox Valley continues to be a big lens um, that is being used when looking at all of our financial plans. And we're always continuing to strive, to strive that balance between short-term impacts while ensuring that long-term fiscal stability and sustainability particularly again with that COVID lens. Many of our service plans that will be presented to you over the next several weeks, um, when presented in summer of 2020, made commitments through the 2022 uh, financial planning year. So you'll see some of those ongoing commitments reflected in those financial plans. And we're always keeping in mind our goal to move towards a long-term financial sustainability framework when looking at all of our service delivery. We're also completing projects in, in progress while assessing uh, ca uh, capacities to deliver upcoming and future projects, both over the short and longer term. To give you a sense of, of what you'll see in our various financial plans, overall in 2022, we have budgeted about 20, $62 million in capital projects across a multitude of services. Spread that out across the five-year plan, we're looking at capital projects in the value of about $231 million. Some very, you know, much larger projects, but some very small projects as well. So that gives you kind of a bit of a sense of the full scope of, of kind of what staff uh, are, are currently, you know, looking to manage. We, of course, also want to ensure alignment with our CBRD core values, our board strategic drivers, and those core service areas as we've as were identified and previously spoke to through um, the board's annual strategic planning. And lastly, of course, we always keep risk management in mind, whether that's fiscal, environmental, i.e. mitigation, supply chain issues that we're obviously continuing to see, etc. So what this next slide will show you is just a bit of an example of a service that there is no anticipated requisition change year over year, but as Morris spoke to, what that assessed value can kind of do to how that requisition gets paid by the various participants. So this particular function, function 660, kind of uh, you know illustrates where all uh, participating jurisdictions uh, you know, play within this one, just how a zero change in requisition can kind of ebb and flow between the various partners. So for example, you'll see that area A is looking to, to pay an additional 3.45%, where area B is actually up 8%, where a municipality like Courtney is actually looking at a 4% decrease. And it's really all relative to as we saw in, in, in BC Assessment's presentation, where yes, we saw somewhere in the magnitude of 30, 35% increases in the municipalities by way of assessment, 
we see 40 to 45% increases within the rural areas. So it's all really how that mix kind of plays together. So of course, looking at things first from the revenue side of the budget, as you can see on the slide, the total revenue or the total budget this year is estimated to be $140.6 million. That is broken down, of course, through, you know, via a number of areas. Most notably, taxation is estimated to make up about 24% of the overall revenue for the CVRD in 2022. At first blush, this may, may look like it represents an increase of about 5.8% or 2.1 million from 2021 when comparing straight year over year total requisition, parcel and frontage taxes. However, I do um, you know, note that there's a couple of things you do need to keep in mind. Firstly, that includes the uh, nearly $800,000 in requisition for the three uh, Union Bay Improvement District converted services that we took over. So that taxation is actually new to us as, as a jurisdiction, but it's not new taxation to, to, to the public. And so in, in subsequent slides, you'll see how I've incorporated that in to, to give you a, a, you know, a bit more realistic view of kind of what the year over year changes are. Of course, that also includes the addition of the three new local service areas in 2022. I did speak to two of those being the Dem and Hornby Islands Internet Connectivity and the Saratoga Beach Mosquito Management. But there was also a number of community hall services that were created this year. And a new service was established for Area A, Bain Sound specifically. And lastly, this also includes a scheduled increase of $400,000 for the uh, Comox Valley Sewerage Surge, which we continue to define as a requisition, but it really isn't that. It's more of a, a user levy or a user fee. And of course, revenues also include, or sorry, um, other revenue, or uh, sorry, other transfers on this slide here, um, you know, do include things like prior year surpluses that, again, we will you know, kind of note in each of the uh, financial plan presentations. So to give you a sense of overall of what those percentages kind of translate into dollars, as I said, for, uh, taxation, we're looking at about $38.4 million overall. That represents, um, in 2021 dollars, that was about a 24% increase. We're looking at about a similar percentage this year. Other transfers, which again, I noted includes grants, reserves, prior year surpluses, et cetera, we're anticipating to be just over $30 million. Um, that total is about 21.3% this year. It was actually much higher last year at about 35. Debt proceeds. Debt proceeds are uh, uh, anticipated to be about 42.8 million. That represents about 30.4% of this year's budget, whereas last year it was actually closer to 23%. And that's just indicative of, of a number of the projects that we have been taking on over the past year where things like long-term debt are now kind of being secured. And lastly, other revenue, which includes things like tipping fees, user rates, et cetera, will be about $29.4 million overall, or about 21% of the overall budget, and it was about 18% in 2021. So all told, that $140.6 million overall budget is broken down to be about $78.4 million on the operating side and about $62.2 million on the capital side. To compare that with the adopted budget for 2021, we had an adopted budget of about 148.5 million, which was broken down into $76 million in operating and about 72.5 million in capital. So this slide just gives you a little bit of a kind of a year over year comparison, just to kind of give you a global snapshot of, of kind of what we're looking at for, for requisitions. So requisition, including the Surer levy, 2021, we, we were at about 35.9 or close to $36 million. For 2022, we're currently estimating that to be 37.3 million. That's a difference of about 1.3 million or 3.71%. If we were to take the sewer levy out of that mix, and as you can see there in 21, that was 6.8 million versus 7.2 this year, that total overall change in requisition uh, lowers to about 3.2%, 29 million versus just over 30 million, or about a $933,000 difference.
So what is driving some of these changes? I've, I've shown you kind of what we'll call the top eight services where there's been some significant increases in requisitions. And as I noted, all of these service budgets will be delivered to the respective committees or commissions, et cetera, over the next several weeks so that you get a chance to see some more fulsome information as to what is driving a lot of these. I've spoken to, to the sewage service increase, and that has been kind of a planned, you know, kind of steady increase since 2016 to bring everything in line. And certainly as we move toward things like sewer conveyance, which is certainly a big ticket item in that service. We are seeing some, some significant um, requests for, for um, increases in, in places like Hornby and Demon Island garbage. So I've reflected those there. With Hornby specifically, some of that is being driven by just increased costs. Some of it is also being driven by recent um, uh, collective bargaining that has seen some increases on that side and just some other desired kind of activities over the course of the year. What the board will see new this year is a requisition uh, proposed for the emergency shelter land acquisition service. That is the new, the, 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 a requisition that hasn't really been made in that service since uh, about 2012. Uh, and this was based on discussions from last year's financial planning process that both myself and Alala Malali will be speaking to when we, when we get to presenting that budget. Other areas of note are, are uh, electoral area planning, uh, Bain Sound and BNC Parks and Greenway service, uh, Comox Valley Recreation and, and Comox Valley Transit. Overall, those six, eight services represent about $1.5 million in, in overall increases. We do, however, it's important to note, out of the uh, 101 services that we do deliver, there's about one third or 32 services where there's been net zero or very near net zero increases in requisition. And actually we have two services where there's been some significant decreases, most notably um, the Comox Valley Economic Development Service, which of course is in the process of a service review and, and, and the process of morphing. So we have seen a significant decline in, in that budget being proposed for 2022. As I've noted, further details and background information on each of these services will be covered through the various financial planning reports coming forward. Um, and, and we always try to take a look at it as at a kind of a measure a rebound a measured rebound from curtailment stemming from COVID-19 and obviously keeping the rethink or uh, Comox Valley renewal plans in mind. And of course, as part of that renewal plan for last year, we, were, we actually ended up with a requisition reduction, modest one of 226,000 or 0.64%. Some of what you're seeing here does represent a, a return to pre-COVID-19 service levels, particularly in places like recreation, but we are still anticipating reduced or uncertain revenues, staffing shortages, council programs, et cetera, and certainly services such as that. With transit, we also are looking at some pre-approved service level expansion. Um, and of course, we're also looking at the aforementioned increases in, in, in sewer. Now, I'm also happy to report that in two significant service areas, both our Comox Strathcona Regional Hospital District, which while separate from the regional district per se, is an important levy on our, our residents and our taxpayers, and our Comox Strathcona Waste Management Service are both looking at flat requisition levels versus 2021. So in the hospital's case, we're looking at a, a, a 21 uh, level requisition of 12.6 million, we're in solid waste, we're looking at staying at the 5 million that we were at last year. So this next slide just gives a bit of an overall uh, requisition comparison based on the consolidated budget. And of course, it's important to note that this does include all of our local service areas, and that, as you heard a little bit in Maurice's presentation, increases in requisition in any jurisdiction can be due to a number of factors. It can be obviously due to an increased revenue requirement required for that particular service. Or of course, it can be influenced by increased assessment values that impact the apportionment of that requisition amongst the participants in the service. As I noted, even in a service with zero increase in requisition, there can be an increase or decrease in the apportionment uh, to each participant due to those various uh, assessed value shifts. And we look at the impact, uh, we looked at the impact of that, of course, in, in one of the previous slides. It can also be a combination of both of those factors as well. 
Sometimes this, this need for additional revenue can be the result of loss of other forms of revenue, such as grant funding, surplus funds, depleted reserves that may necessitate an increase in, in taxation. And given I've talked about the expense, uh, sorry, the revenue side of the budget, certainly we wanna focus on the expenditure side as well. So again, as you'll see, total expenditures match that total revenue at 140.6 million. And it's broken down here as follows. So personnel costs, anticipated personnel costs are, two point, uh, are just under $22 million this year. That represents about 16% of our overall budget. That's up slightly from 2021, which was at 13%. Overall operating costs are anticipated to be at uh, 38.3 million. That's a 27% uh, portion of, of this year's budget versus 23% last year. Moving into debt servicing, debt servicing this year is anticipated to be about $9 million overall or 6% of the budget pie, where it was closer to 14% budgeted last year. Reserve contributions. Reserve contributions are budgeted at just uh, over 9.1 million for the year, or about 7% of the overall budget. And that's essentially unchanged from last year, percentage wise. And then lastly, capital expenditures. Capital expenditures, as I noted you know, at the beginning of this presentation are estimated to be about six, uh, 62.2 million for 2022. That represents about 44% of the budget. Very similar percentage as to last year, which was at 43%. And again, just to give you a uh, perspective, last year's overall budget was 148.5 million. So at this point now, we wanna give the board a bit of a perspective as to what to expect in the various financial plans. Sorry, I just lost my mouse here. Uh, the old fashioned way. Just want to kind of focus on, on the personnel changes going forward. So as you can see there in 2021, our fur time equivalents or FTEs for 2021 were at about 189.48. That equated to an overall head count of about 251 bodies. And of course, that's representative of a number of the casual part-time positions that we have in certainly places like our recreation service, such as our solid waste service and the like. For 2022, we are anticipating an FTE count of 209.22 or a head count overall of about 268. Within that increase in FTEs, there are about nine new positions that are being proposed in this year's financial plan. Again, details on each of those new positions will be spoken to when each budget manager presents their respective budgets over the next several weeks. Some assumptions and forecasts to keep in mind, similar service levels anticipated within, it, within most services for 2022. Of course, I've spoken to in recreation complexes, we are moving towards a return to pre-COVID-19 levels with some uncertainties as to how things on the, on the uh, participation or revenue side will bear out. We're also looking at some, some changes in our Comox Strathcona Waste Management Service, largely to respond to the increased demand and traffic that has certainly been seen um, at our landfill locations as you know, partly during COVID. And also some increases also in, in our planning service, which also does include bylaw enforcement and our GIS department. A couple of other things that, that kind of influence this is of course, uh, QP bargaining was completed in 2021 and USW, which is largely our recreation staff is currently underway. And lastly, to give you a sense of the change you know, with, you know, with, with existing positions, we currently have 11 existing positions, whether full-time or part-time, that are currently vacant. And that's not inclusive of any new positions that are being contemplated. And of those 11, four of those are actually term or student positions. So this slide gives you a sense of, of the new positions that are being proposed uh, in this year's financial plan. Two are related to our recreation services, and that's a custodian and a program supervisor for our aquatics and skate shops uh, at, one, at one FTE each. Uh, we do also have a SCADA technician plan for 2022 within corporate services. And that's largely driven by the, the continued growth of the kind of electronic monitoring and, and, and computerization of a number of our services, most in Olivia, our water treatment plant. Uh, so there's growing demand to have qualified staff that can kind of meet the demands of that. 
There's a number of services that have been proposed within the Comox Strathcona Waste Management, and these positions have already been uh, presented to the Greater Solid Waste Board, uh, both in its preliminary budget in November and most recently in January uh, as part of the proposed budget. And then lastly, two positions being slated for, for planning and development services, one being a senior planner, uh, and the last being a bylaw compliance coordinator. So to give you a sense of some of the capital expenditures being proposed for 2022, some of these will be obviously very familiar to, to you. Uh, Mount Washington Fire Building, of course, uh, is, is definitely being planned this year. That's pended the successful AAP that is, I believe, currently underway, if not soon to start. Obviously, we've been working the last couple of years on, on our uh, $126 million uh, you know, Comox Valley water treatment plant. We're just kind of in the final stages of getting that project wrapped up and, and at completion. Have a little bit of dollars kind of uh, earmarked for 2022 just to deal with those last little wrap up items. We are also undertaking you know, some significant fiber connectivity work uh, over the course of the next several years, but particularly in 20, starting in 2022. And, and one uh, project of note is Ryan Road to East Courtney Reservoir. We will of course be also con you know, co commencing with the work to look at the potential of extending water services south. There'll be a lot of engineering and design certainly this year with some uh, potential for construction, but we're anticipating that probably won't happen until future years. Obviously the big one that the board is aware of is sewer conveyance and how that will kind of, kind of flow through things over the next several years. And of course, working towards completion and commissioning of our regional compost facility with our solid waste service, hopefully within the fall of this year. And also with solid waste, we're beginning cell two engineering uh, design and working towards construction for cell two uh, within the Comox Valley Waste Management Center. And at the Campbell River site, once that, once that is up and running and regional organics is in place, looking at the, uh, um, the uh, planned closure of that particular landfill. So lastly, just to give the board a, a quick recap, starting January 31st with both the BCOB and electoral area services committees, we will be starting to roll out the service budgets to the various committees. Ultimately, the 2022-2026 uh, financial plan will be brought forward to the board by way of bylaw for uh, adoption starting on March 29th and completing on March 31st. And of course, as the board is aware, March 31st is the ultimate deadline for when we have to have that uh, five-year budget bylaw approved. This consolidated proposed budget presentation and all the presentations associated with this year's financial planning process will ultimately be made available on our financial planning page. The link is certainly provided there and I will also provide that out to the directors. In addition to the information that will be provided uh, uh, through the website, as we have done in past years, I will commit again to providing to the directors the so-called house tables, which provides the proposed tax impacts per household by participants. And we'll also provide the requisitions by participants at the proposed budget. And uh, again, some of that will be provided on the website. Some of it will be provided by direct handout. And lastly, again, just wanna reiterate that we're always continuing to strive to balance ongoing COVID recovery with the need to plan for long-term sustainability in these challenging and uncertain times. And, and, and we certainly take a look at all of those respective lenses when, when making our financial uh, decisions and bringing those recommendations forward for the board for, for its uh, deliberations. So that is where this presentation ends. I thank everyone and certainly would uh, entertain any questions. Thanks so much, um, Kevin. And I'm just gonna wait to see if anyone has questions. I have Director Arbor here in the room. Yeah, thank you. So um, obviously we're looking at projected initial budgets before uh, we go through them in the next two months. Um, so those are just basically uh, the rough figures from staff. Um, so just, um, you know, I think I think everyone in the public is conscious that um, where you know the rate of inflation is now outpacing sort of what's happening to wages and people. Like we're we're in a very fragile kind of space. I think as a not just here but across BC and across Canada. So hopefully the uh, Ottawa and and uh, Victoria can help us navigate those tricky waters, which are global as well. But it's really concerning. I. 
I like that staff comes back with something that, you know, is the 3.2% kind of idea. I have a question for staff, which is, um, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of work has gone internally with, with our executive team and staff to get us to this point where you're initially presenting to the board. So can you, uh, for example, in any organization, I imagine that all the budget managers would bring cases for adding people and such. So with the eight recommended new positions, how many total uh, positions were requested from budget managers for consideration? Um, I'll answer that. Um, any other detail or, or other questions about the business cases on them, I'll, I'll refer to James. But in, in originally, we were looking at 16 to 17 positions. And uh, what I do with our managers is to really vet the need of those to review where um, service demands have decreased and there may, may be reallocation of, of duties and responsibilities or alternatives for service delivery, either by contract or um, working with our community partners or otherwise. So we, we look at all avenues and, and able our, this year we're able to take about 16 requests down to about nine. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the presentation. We don't have a recommendation yet, but so it's on receipt. Is anyone opposed to receiving that report from financial services? Hearing and seeing none, that's approved. Um, I'm gonna try and take us to about six o'clock and then we can take a break if that's okay and stretch legs. So we're moving on to our electoral area service. Actually, I'm sorry, Chair, there's four budget presentations to, for Kevin to now review. Uh, so that would be uh, starting with the member municipal administration. Thank you. Thanks. So then uh, <laughs> we were not finished. Um, so moving back to, to Kevin then. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and to the directors. And I believe I'm still on shared screen. So can everybody see the uh, member municipality EA slide? No. No way. Okay. I will see if I can reshare here. It's a trouble when I'm managing three different screens. There we go. How about now? Yeah. Perfect. Good to go. All right. So thanks once again. This is where we get into some of the more meat and potatoes. So yeah, um, as Russell alluded to, we will be moving then into some of our administration uh, services or budgets uh, for, for the board's consideration. And we, we do start with the member municipality and electoral area admin. And of course, then I'll speak briefly to our member municipality debt. And then I will be speaking to the admin and general government. And as we mentioned at the onset of these presentations, a number of our senior management staff are here as well to assist me with, with any questions that may arise. So starting with member municipality administration, this is our function 100. And this supports the member municipality representatives for the CBRD board governance expenses and management costs. This is where um, you know, we, we direct charge a, a number of positions, most notably our chief administrative officer and executive assistant, as it's indicated there, based on our uh, support services and other cost allocations policy. Uh, those two positions are allocated here to the tune of about 30%. And then they're allocated subsequently to other services that we'll be getting into. Um, other positions that are allocated here include our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. His position is allocated here about 30% as well, as is the Manager of Legislative Services. So to give you a sense of what that budget is looking like and the year-over-year -year comparison, we're looking at a requisition, uh, proposed requisition increase of just over $28,000 uh, from 536 to 565. That is largely being driven by a couple of things. Uh, most notably, uh, a slight increase in our support service costs to this particular service. And that's largely being driven by a shift in the apportionment of the Civic Room B space from our Comox Valley Emergency Program service over to member municipality and EA admin. All of the same participating jurisdictions or contributing jurisdictions pay into each of those respective services. So this is just a bit of a shift between what budget is actually kind of landing in. 
Within this service, we are not proposing a reserve contribution again for 2022. And that's largely driven by the fact that we do have a fairly healthy uh, future expenditure reserve to this service, which has a current balance of approximately $223,000. And so as the slide indicates, we're looking at an overall proposed budget increase of about $39,000 from, from 2021, or an increase of about 7% overall, but certainly not translating to a 7% increase in, in requisition. To give the member municipalities a sense of what that means to them year over year. So for COMOX, that would be about a $12,000, uh, $12.5,000 uh, increase. Uh, Courtney looking at about an $11,000 increase and Cumberland about a $5,000 increase to make up that total. Moving I'm, into electric. Sorry, Kevin, oh. Madam Chair, if I might suggest that after each one of these, um, we open it up for questions in case uh, the municipalities have any questions on that before we go to the Absolutely. Other. Thanks. I'll ask if anyone has questions. I do have one, um, and it's actually pursuant to, um, I, I believe, a resolution that the board gave um, direction to staff to look at um, board remuneration. Um, I know that wouldn't kick in until, um, you know, the next, after the next election, um, but does that need to get, um, like, do we guess if that goes through or would that come out of reserve if something is increased? So through the chair and thanks to the chair for that question. So yes, I did. Uh, fail to allude that in this year's budget, both in this budget and, and the next budget we're presenting EA admin, we have built in some costs to review board remuneration and board expenses. Uh, once the board kind of deliberates on that, those typically then take effect the following year for the new board. So those wouldn't actually have a budget impact in 2022, or certainly we're not anticipating that, those would kick in in 2023. So of course, everything right now is based on the current bylaw and based on the, the um, cost of living increases that were built into that board remuneration based on, the, on the, what's in currently in place. If that were to change based on a new bylaw being established, then we would build that into our 23 financial planning process. Super, thank you. I don't see any other questions, so I think we can okay. move on to the next service. All right, thanks so much. So yes, moving into electoral areas administration and election services, functions 130 and 131. As obviously it indicates there, this is the budget that supports our electoral area members of the RD. And once again, as I just noted, this is where the board remuneration and board expenses review is budgeted for uh, 2022. This also includes direct charging of some salaries and benefits, again, notably our chief administrative officer and our executive assistant. Based again on our support service policy, that allocation is set at 60%. The remaining 10% of those two positions are allocated to our solid waste management service. And the other, uh, some other notable allocations within this service, again, are our deputy chief CAO, uh, deputy CAO at 40%, our general manager of corporate services at 60%, and lastly, our manager of ledge services at 50%. So to give the rural directors a sense of what that budget was look, will look like, overall, we're anticipating only a $10,000 increase to the requisition from 1,050,000 to 1,060,000. Uh, personnel and director remuneration costs both increase by 2% year over year, reflecting an annual CPI. And again, in the director's case, that's driven by, again, the bylaw. Operating costs are anticipated to increase by $64,000 from 2021. And that's largely being driven about 70, sorry, 77% of that increase is largely associated to the cost we have to build into this service budget at this time of year for the fall 2022 local government elections. So that deals with all of the costs associated with putting on those, those, those elections. And overall, as you can see there, the overall proposed budget increase is 33,575, which represents about a 3% increase from 2021. So to give the rural directors a kind of a sense of year over year changes, and this is again driven a lot by that requisition shift. So area A seeing about a $3,800 increase in, in, in their apportionment, whereas area B is seeing a significant increase at about 16 points uh, or 16,600. But area C is potentially looking at a significant decrease of about 10, uh, 10 and a half thousand to make up that overall $10,000 increase in, in requisition. And then maybe I'll pause there and see if uh, the rural directors certainly have any questions that they'd like to bring forward. 
I, I'm not seeing here in there. I have a question, but I don't know if uh, Director Grief has one. Um, one of the questions or one of the costs associated with election is, is um, the, the polling stations uh, in, in the rural areas. And um, in the last election, we had the old CVRD building that hosted um, election sort of for folks to come and vote, especially from Area B, from the Lazo side of Area B. And now that the building has moved, um, I'm wondering if staff have thought about um, potentially a, a, another site um, in, in Area B. Uh, thank you for the question, Madam Chair. And I'll just ask Chief Martins uh, to put his mind to that. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair. Uh, yes, staff have been given consideration to a voting location in uh, Area B. It was certainly some of the feedback that we heard during the last general election. Uh, I don't have a, a location booked at this point, so it'd be remiss just to, to name, a, name a site, but certainly that's on our minds and, and part of our plans. Great, great. No, no placing, but I just want, want to make sure we have a budget for that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, I don't see other questions, so I think you can move on for that. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so now we'll move into member municipality debt and just as a bit of a synopsis, of course, municipalities are required to borrow uh, their long-term funds through regional districts. Councils will adopt a, a loan authorization bylaw which requires Ministry of Municipal, Municipal Affairs Certificate of Approval. And then council would subsequently pass security issuing resolutions and forward all of that to the regional district and to the Municipal Finance Authority, ultimately. Regional districts then adopt security issuing bylaws, which again require ministerial certificate of approval. And a borrowing method uh, is issuance of debentures through the uh, Municipal Finance Authority, of course. So of course, how agreements are entered into is the municipalities would come through the regional district and the regional district would then enter into the agreements with MFA and represent the municipalities on behalf of that long-term borrowing. And ultimately the regional district becomes by default a guarantor for that debt. So to give you a sense of some of the changes we're anticipating, looking at the three municipal jurisdictions, we're anticipating about a $79,000 increase overall in debt servicing for Courtney versus a slight decrease for Comox and a significant increase for Cumberland uh, year over year. For Courtney, that's largely the result of the Fifth Street Bridge project debt issue uh, that was completed in the fall of 2021. And with Cumberland, that's actually the result of the Village of Cumberland's new fire hall with that debt issue going online as of spring of 2021. Questions, folks? Nope, not seeing any. Okay, great. And then moving on to kind of the, the, the back end of this presentation, this is where we'll kind of give you an overview of the administration and general government service, our, our service 110. So of course, functions 110 through 119 provide the organizational support to all of our CVRD services. That includes corporate management, corporate and legislative services, finance and procurement, human resources, information systems, communications and public engagement, fiscal services and capital, and of course, the corporate office. And we will be providing a bit of a snapshot on each of those function service areas in, in, in a few slides time. So to give you a sense of the funding sources that are available to general admin, of course, the only taxation that currently exists within our general admin or admin and general government service is a $175,000 tax requisition. That tax requisition supports contributions for Harmston, the Harmston office asset renewal and replacement. So as we did with our farmer space, we do always try to put some dollars aside to deal with those ongoing costs and looking down the road to when we have to then replace major components or pieces of, of, of the building. General admin also does have a couple of service fees that we garner from other entities, most notably being North Island 911 Corporation. So currently we, we bring in about $132,600 in admin uh, fees or levies uh, from that corporation. Uh, and then, of course, from the Strathcona Regional Hospital District, about $151,000 uh, in admin support that we provide to, to, to that board and, and that corporation. Of course, the lion's share of, of the revenues that come into general admin are, are provided by way of our support service cost allocation policy. The majority of these funds are charged out or cost allocated 
by way of recoveries throughout all of our uh, CDRD services based on that support service policy uh, that was approved back in 2012. And there's a, a, a formula that's really kind of driven as to kind of how that rolls out. We look at basically three core service areas, most notably being human resources, IT uh, or, or, or computer count, and then of course, corporate uh, office square footage space. And then we couple that with the general support that's required for a general men to meet the needs of supporting all of the various services throughout the organization. Some other notable funding sources, of course, you know, uh, if, if you know, we do have a, a surplus uh, from the previous years, we will ultimately bring that forward. And as the directors are aware with each of our services, those surpluses retain within the services in which they're generated or the deficits if, if the case were that. Um, you know, those aren't shared between services. They are, you know, fully retained within each of the services in which they're generated. Of course, general administration support service charges will continue to be monitored in future as annual operational and maintenance costs for the new corporate office become fully known. And in fact, we have slated some dollars in this year's budget to do a bit of a refresh of kind of the asset renewal and replacement plan and the O&M costs associated with this building so that we can make sure we're, uh, you know, prudently reflecting those costs in our budget. Of course, we'll also, you know, at times bring in various provincial or federal grants, and this also does include our community works funds. And that can include things like our regional district basic grant, which typically has been about $160,000. And then of course, any other various grant programs as they become available. General administration is also at times uh, a place where programs, you know, or, or initiatives lie that maybe don't have a natural service for which they fit. Some of the notable ones uh, to, to, to bring forward are community health network funding uh, and expenditures, or sorry, and the expenditures that are derived from that again this year. So that's a flow through of funding we received from Island Health and then passed on to the community health network. We also have carried forward a community works fund contribution into the budget again this year for the Hornby Islands Arts Center. And then new this year, or certainly new last year, I suppose, is a contribution of community works funds Towards the, contra, uh, towards the Dem and Hornby internet connectivity. So there's about $142,000 contribution to community works funds slated in um, the uh, general and budget for that purpose. To give you a sense of the overall budget first on the revenue side. So this kind of gives you the highlights of what I've just spoken to. So you can see grant and lose don't change uh, you know, significantly up slightly uh, estimated to about $6,000. Senior government grants up slightly again to about uh, by about twenty thousand dollars. The requisition is staying flat, as I noted, at one hundred and seventy-five. Uh, we previously had some sales of service. Uh, we were providing some some GIS and IT services to the village of Cumberland. Um, that that is no longer the case, so that has now gone away. What's largely within that other revenue and recoveries is our support service um, recoveries from our various. Uh, uh, services. So that's up slightly at about $35,000. Currently, we are not anticipating a need to bring in any funds from reserve. So that, that goes down to zero this year. And then lastly, we're currently anticipating a surplus carry forward of about 1.5 million. But of course, as we complete the year-end process, which is now just underway and will kind of happen over the next kind of month, month and a half, we'll then kind of fine tune that estimate and bring that forward back as part of the recommended budget. So then to give you a bit of a snapshot on each of the, of the sub portions of, of this budget. So I'll start off with um, first noting that overall, uh, overall we're looking at a reduction in the admin and general uh, government operating budget of about $248,000 or 4% from 2021. Some of the costs included in that, starting with management services, function 111, include the costs of the CAO's office with without the CAO and executive personnel costs, which of course are allocated elsewhere. The operating budget has decreased in 2022, primarily due to the distribution of the initial BC Safe Restart funding being completed in 2021. And of course, budgets the budgets include carry forwards, as I noted, for the Harvey Island Art Center contribution and the Dem and Harvey Internet Connectivity. They will actually land in, in our function uh, 111. 
Notable in this as well is the final year of a two-year contribution committed to, to the uh, Comox Valley Social Planning Society. That's to the tune of $15,000. It is important to note that the Accessibility Committee has requested that such a contribution be provided on an ongoing basis and actually increased to $30,000 annually. So based on that, staff has put together uh, you know, so some, some food for thought, I guess, if we want to call it. We do know that, uh, that there's two additional community groups that have also come forward seeking similar support, that being the Substance Use Strategy Committee, which I believe is under the auspices of the Health Network, and then the Comox Valley Food Policy Council, which again, I believe is under the auspices of Lush Valley. It should be noted that these groups, groups are seeking administrative support. Traditionally, grants uh, are provided for specific projects or programs. Uh, consideration should, always be given, uh, should also be given, though, to the many nonprofit organizations that provide good services uh, within our community and assume their own administration costs. Consideration should also be given to the precedent and financial implications such contributions, particularly through this service, can often set. Furthermore, at least one of the groups is suggesting a deliverable of funding to enable their participation in the upcoming RGS and OCP processes. It is notable that many of the individuals and groups that already are anticipating to participate in those services are doing so without any kind of financial support. Staff is therefore recommending um, such ongoing contributions should not um, over the long term be provided through the admin or general service budget, but instead be moved to an appropriate service if available or supported via the establishment of a new service. In the interim, financial support could be considered uh, you know, for, for one or more of these through the Comox Valley Regional District's Rural Community Grant Services in conjunction with support from the corresponding grant programs of our municipal partners. This would then demonstrate regional support that would provide in part merit to look at maybe down the road, the potential establishment of a new regional service that may meet one or more of those needs. And maybe I'll pause there because I do see Director Morin has a question. Yes, thank you, Director Morin. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to provide clarification um, regarding the, the Food Policy Council because it, it tends to be, I know it comes up at Courtney Council quite often as well, um, because um, Lush's Executive Director Marita is also um, the coordinator for the Food Policy Council, there's often confusion that, um, that the Food Policy Council is under the umbrella of Lush and actually Lush is one, um, one representative on that council that's made up of local government as well as um, other stakeholders around food security, et cetera. So I, I just wanted to make that clear because sometimes people think, um, I, we, we've even had the public come or say, you know, to us that if we're giving money to the Food Policy Council, we're giving it to Lush, but that's, that's actually not the case. Lush is one representative on that larger um, regional um, council. So I just wanted to clarify that because there is some confusion in the community. Thank you. Thanks, Director Morin. Yes, uh, I have Director Grant. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Kevin, you alluded to the building here and, I, and it got me thinking about asset management plans and you said we had about 178 thousand dollars in a reserve fund and, and i'm wondering if we do have an asset management plan for things like the building and of course what strikes me even more is and i'm not even sure where this plan would go but water sewer and solid waste i don't even know who owns those to be honest with you and i don't know if we're doing it but the numbers if you start putting them together can get absolutely staggering and, you know, at 178, I just did some quick math and we should be putting 300,000 a year if this building's going to last 50 years. You know, water and sewer gets ridiculous how much you could put into them. But I don't even know if that would fall here or not. So through the chair to, to uh, Director Grant, thank you for that question. And no, I mean, those services maintain their own reserves. Um, and certainly I can assure you that, uh, you know, we are looking at asset management across the organization. Uh, we started to undertake that process fully a number of years ago. We're still very much in the developmental stage of many of those asset management plans. But as I alluded to this year, within our 
a 119 function budget, which I'll get to later on in this presentation. We have built some dollars in to do a bit of a refresh based on what the consultants provided back when this building was first being conceived by way of an asset uh, uh, renewal and replacement plan and to look at the fulsome O&M costs associated with this building so that we can make sure we are being able to do that longer term outlook or projection as to what we may need to be putting away in future. Because yes, right now, the lion's share of, of, of what we requisitioned, the intent is to be putting that aside. But of course, if we do have funds available by way of things like surplus, et cetera, we will always make sure that we look at reserve uh, contributions as a potential vehicle for that to ensure we are putting dollars away for that future. Thanks, I think that was answered. For, for Director Grant. Um, Kevin, I just want to go back to um, Director Warren's comment. And uh, you also um, alluded to a possible mechanism of funding those, those nonprofit groups through a combined, I believe it was rural community grant and somehow getting the, the municipalities to pay in. And would you be able to clarify that? Because I think that's primarily why, at least for the Food Policy Council, um, that that was brought forward because currently only the, the rural areas are contributing to mm -hmm. that food policy council. And it, it just seemed for fairness, how do we get all of the communities who are um, basically you know, getting some advantages from that food policy council, how do we get them to contribute? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Chair. So yes, I can provide some clarification. What we meant by that is in the absence of any type of regional community grant service currently, yes, I mean, the, one of the primary vehicles we have at our disposal is the Rural Community Grant Service, in addition to some other grant services that focus on arts and culture, for example, which is a electoral area only service. And then of course, our, our recreation grant service, which all uh, the uh, jurisdictions participate in. But, you know, if, you know, in the absence of being able to do it through a vehicle such as general administration, where again, over the long term, that's not really an appropriate place to, to kind of house such contributions. You know, we could undertake that by looking at a combination of having the electoral areas fund a portion of those asks through the various rural community grant services in participation or in conjunction with our municipal uh, partners and their respective granting programs. So we'd be looking at doing some kind of joint, I suppose, contribution to help support um, th those asks. Okay, I'm seeing nods here, but I'm just wondering if that would be in place in time, like for this year, or when do you, for like, how would something like that roll out? Um, I, I certainly at this point, again, in the absence of any formalized service, I mean, those those requests could be brought forward to the electoral areas by way of our uh, on, um, rural community grant application process. And of course, you know, the, the deadline for that is typically the end of February for, for applications to be accepted for those. And then we would roll that out to the electoral area directors, as you're aware, kind of later on in the spring to kind of deliberate and discuss. Uh, I can't certainly speak to what the various municipal partners uh, kind of processes are in that vein, but um, you know, certainly there could be opportunity to kind of try to um, look at coordinating those various activities. Uh, Madam Chair, may I suggest that we will, um, we will put together a memo to send to the municipalities to say that we have these requests. We're going to refer them to our EA directors through their grant programs. For, their, for potential contribution from the EAs, would you please consider a municipal contribution on the basis if this sort of was some sort of regional service? So we, we will help to facilitate that discussion by giving the heads up to the municipalities, not knowing where they are in their decision mm -hmm. and budget process with respect to their own grant programs. Thanks for that. Um, I see a question from Director Arbor. Yeah, I just wanna support um, sort of Kevin's analysis in the sense that if we look at how we collectively work around the homelessness coalition, for example, right? So we went through a referendum and had a service established. And I do agree that things should not live for very long in the admin budget. That, that That's almost to me screams kind of emergency management <laughs> in terms of the trying to make things work. And in the grant and aid in rural areas, we do have a new uh, program for three years. But that would be a question to have as well, whether this is something that we want, you know, that we expect like the homelessness to last for the next 20 years, or whether this is something more like for the next three or four. So I agree with the CEO, if we can get a report back on that aspect later, that'd be great. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions from the online. Oh, back to you, Kevin. Okay, thanks so much. 
So yeah, I'll next move into our corporate administration or function 112. So as you can see there, personnel costs are slated to increase slightly by $31,000 year over year. And operating costs are essentially uh, slated to remain flat at about that $140,000. Uh, for personnel costs, I mean, that's largely due in part to a 0.3 FTE increase for our Harmston Info Center. So we have done a bit of a rejig of some of our front end staff this year to, uh, you know, kind of uh, deal with the information flow and, and the demands associated with that. Um, you know, so there have been some, some recommended changes in, in that vein. Um, as I noted, operational costs are essentially otherwise kind of staying flat at uh, 2021 levels. Moving into financial services, 113, the operating budget has you know, increased uh, you know, versus 2021, as you can see there by about $300,000. Uh, there's a number of things that are kind of driving that. Firstly, personnel costs. There's 2 uh, a 2.4 FTE increase over last year, resulting primarily from the creation of uh, a, a new manager financial operation position that was you know, kind of brought forward to the board previously. That's 100% allocated to this uh, function. In addition to that, we also have the uh, new position being the financial accounting technician. That is the staff person that we've brought over from the Union Bay Improvement District uh, as part of that uh, uh, conversion. So that is allocated about 60% to this function. Plus we have also reallocated um, our, our procurement technician position. That previously was allocated very complexly through a multitude of different service areas, along with what we have undertaken with some of our communication staff over the last couple of years that we've reported to the board on previously. We're trying to draw as many of those back into our general admin uh, service as much as possible and to allow our support service policy and process to kind of do its work ultimately. So that's why we've seen a shift back in, in some of the allocations associated with that position. Uh, some other drivers of the increase within finance are, are uh, software and license costs. Those are up $14,000. That's largely to uh, accommodate for the purchase of some new procurement software um, that we're eagerly anticipating this year, as well as just some doing ongoing uh, budget software customizations as we continue to kind of drive into Questica and its uh, ultimate capabilities for reporting out on our, on our budgeting on an annual basis. Um, and then lastly, some legal and other professional fees. Those are up about 27,500. What's really driving that is our shift and, and focus into asset retirement obligations. Um, those new standards are set to start to come into effect um, in, in um, after fiscal year 2023. So we'll be using the next two years to really start kind of getting our heads into that and looking at how we need to kind of put systems in place to help support the organization across the board. Uh, so we have built some, some other professional fees within uh, the finance budget to bring in some external help to assist the finance team with the development of, of, of that game plan. So then moving into human resources, uh, function 115. Again, as you'll note there, the operating budget has uh, increased modestly by $35,000 over 2021. And this is really being driven by a couple of factors. First and foremost, personnel costs, you'll note are up $59,000. That's uh, the result of an increase of 0.4 FTEs for our two HR coordinator positions. Just given the, the, the breadth of demands on their time, it was felt uh, we needed to increase some FTEs there slightly to allow them to, to meet the uh, existing workload. And then lastly, other professional fees, uh, budget has been reduced uh, within HR, and that's largely because several projects were completed in 2021. So that budget has actually declined by about $21,000 overall. Kevin, there's a question from Director Arbor. Certainly. Thanks. I, I see we slot um, legal under financial services, so it's hard to see the breakdown. My question is... Um, when we incur legal costs, do they get attributed, all of them, to 113? Or, um, for example, if it's in a rural area, is, does it get attributed to a uh, budget, uh, for example, bylaw and planning? Or do all the legal costs end up shared? 
uh, through the chair to Director Arbor. Yes, thanks so much for that question. Yes, to clarify, no, this is just legal costs associated with financial services specifically. We do budget legal services across all our service budgets. So if places like bylaw, for example, or, or building inspection or places like that anticipate significantly uh, legal costs, uh, they will build that within their uh, uh, specific budgets. The professional services and legal costs I refer to here all relate to that uh, asset retirement obligations work that we do have to undertake over the next couple of years. Thanks, I think that's it, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So from there, I'll move into uh, information services, our function 116. And uh, Brian Pearson is on the line to, to correct me if I'm, my numbers aren't quite exact, but this is kind of based a bit on, on what we presented to the board last year. So overall, through the organization, our IT department manages about 181 PCs and laptops through multiple locations and, and multiple services. That's in addition to about 70 plus smart devices, whether that's smartphones or iPads or, or other tablets. It also includes up to 75 plus servers and 30 SCADA related systems throughout the CVRD. And SCADA specifically, that is an area where we've seen some exponential growth over the last number of years, which is really what's driving the need for this SCADA, additional SCADA technician position that we noted earlier. We are seeing though an overall reduction in personnel costs of 0.5 FTE, FTEs here. And that is largely because last year we had um, uh, budgeted for a network support specialist position, uh, which was going to be at that time cost shared 50% between the uh, regional district and 50% between the North Island 911 Corp. Due to some changes there, that position is now fully uh, seconded or 100% seconded to North Island 911, and therefore it's no longer a hit to the specific budget item. There's also just some general increases in operating costs here, due in large part to additional software and licensing costs. Of course, that's a big driver with, within this service budget specifically. So we are seeing some about $50,000 in general increases there. Uh, that includes uh, an allowance uh, for corporate software licenses for any new staff that may come online. And also includes the uh, ever-growing uh, costs associated with our Microsoft upgrade costs. All right. Moving into the back half of general admin, uh, 117 corporate communications. So as you can see there, personnel costs are up about $76,000 from past year. Again, uh, as noted in some of the earlier ones, this is again, based on that continued uh, redistribution of, of staff allocation time, particularly in this case with our communications staff. Some of that time was previously charged out through a number, a multitude of other services. So we're trying to draw that back in here and then again, let support service do its work. So a further 0.72 FTE is now being reflected um, in general administration and charged out via support service in an effort to increase that fairness and transparency across the entire organization. Within communications, operating cost increases are largely attributed to a major piece of work this year, which is for the CVRD website, and in particular, all of the back end upgrades uh, and enhancements that are being planned for 2022, and those are currently being budgeted at about $50,000. Moving into fiscal services and capital. This is where for general admin, certainly uh, the majority of capital expenditures uh, on an ongoing basis um, um, you know, are kind of funded, if you wanna say, and, and consist largely of IT infrastructure, such as firewalls, uh, website improvements, software needs, server upgrades and equipment upgrades. For 2022, uh, the plan includes various IT projects and upgrades, uh, and that includes some carry forward projects from 2021. Uh, most of which will be funded by way of Capital Works Reserves. Some notable projects uh, within general admin this year are the West Courtney to Harveston Avenue fire, fiber project. So as we noted earlier, we do have a number of fiber projects that we're looking to undertake over the next several years. And this is certainly a, a key one for 2022. And then we also do have two vehicles uh, within our overall fleet that are assigned to general admin that are, are due for replacement. One being our uh, 2011 uh, Nissan Leaf and the second being our 2014 Nissan Rogue. And then lastly, uh, before I 
touch briefly on capital corporate office. So that's for the Harmston space. That's our function 119. As you can see there, uh, personnel costs uh, are um, due to increase very slightly at $11,500. Those are uh, due to an, uh, an addition of a 0 0.10 FTE for some additional branch assistant support that wasn't actually allocated last year. Um, this is where we're also uh, you know, seeing the conversion of the long-term debt uh, um, from uh, interim financing for the Homston corporate space, which of course was secured in 2020. And that is over a 25 year uh, debt repayment. And then lastly, with corporate office uh, operating costs are up uh, from 2021 uh, by the tune of about $37,000. And that's largely driven by uh, the inclusion of some accessibility upgrades to the Harmston space here, particularly uh, with the main level washrooms that's being slated for 2022. Uh, to the tune of about $35,000. And then as I've spoken to a couple of times uh, in this presentation, we have budgeted about $20,000 uh, to uh, earmark for an update to our assessment ma uh, asset management rather or O&M study um, that was uh, put together for us back when the, when the building was first being constructed. So we'll be looking to undertake that work uh, over the course of 2022. And then just quickly, lastly, you'll get a sense of, of some of the capital uh, works on the books. We have about uh, just, just under $550,000 uh, kind of slated in capital projects within general administration this year, many of which I've already previously discussed. And that is it for the presentation at this point for the financial plan. Of course, there'll be much more to come uh, over the next several weeks. Um, just wanted to make sure the directors are aware we are in the process of reaching out to our uh, municipal partner finance officers. We will be looking at scheduling a meeting with them as we do every year to kind of review the specific budgets that each municipality contributes in. So we're looking at slating that for uh, um, over the next couple of weeks and then we'll be bringing them fully up to speed on, on each of those respective budgets. So I will leave it there and thank the very, buyer very much for their time and certainly look for any further questions. Thanks, Kevin. Do you, any of the directors have questions? Yeah, I want to thank Kevin, and I guess we're all probably getting hungry. But uh, I just want to say I, I don't see the uh, the chart on the wall where we knock off all the different services. So um, is that something that we can expect, or or we're actually uh, stopping this tradition? Uh, uh, through the chair to Director Arbor, thanks very much for that. Yes, the dashboard is in process. So typically we wouldn't provide it at this stage, but you likely will, Zoom permitting, of course, uh, certainly be seeing that as we go into the formal budget presentation starting Monday next week. So yes, I will always make sure that we provide that, albeit it is now more electronic uh, than a big full scat piece of paper, but uh, the premise is the same. Thanks, Kevin. I don't see any other questions. Um, this is just for receipt at the moment. So is there anyone opposed to receiving that report from Kevin? Hearing and seeing none, that is approved. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Okay, um, a 10 minute, is that is that an okay? To, I'm not sure if we've got, a, bathroom and food is what I'm hearing here. So 15 minutes, so we'll, we'll We'll return at 6.45. Thanks, everyone. Can somebody Zoom me a plate of food?
on the meeting back to order. It's 6.45 on, on my watch here. Um, so we are at item number three, the Electoral Area Services Committee. We have minutes from January 10th for receipt. Move moved, receipt. And seconded, thanks Dr. Dr. Hillian. Uh, any questions about the minutes? It's a vote of the whole board and anyone um, opposed? And that is carried. We have recommendation number one. It's moved and seconded that staff submit an application for grant funding for the South Sewer Extensions um, Project through the ISIP uh, stream and then a report regarding the extension. Uh, are there any comments? And we have Director Arbor. Thank you, just for the board's benefit. Uh, I just want to thank staff for their work over the last month and a bit. Well, actually much longer than that, but in terms of this particular application, then this is to extend, um, to look to extend the sewage to, uh, towards rural extent in Union Bay and a ton of work is going by and I understand there'll be reports going to the Sewage Commission as well uh, in the future and um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's actually a, a huge opportunity, and we got a, an extension of one month to apply. So that was, I'm sure, good news for staff. Thanks, Director Arbor. I don't see any other questions. It's a vote of the areas. Is anyone opposed? And that recommendation is carried. Thank you. Item number four: the Comox Valley Recreation Commission minutes of January 11th for receipt. Second. Moved and seconded. And uh, any comments? Hearing none, anyone opposed to receipt of the minutes? And that's approved. And we have a recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded by Cole Hamilton. Uh, regarding bylaw 244, the Comox Valley Exhibition Ground fees and charges bylaw uh, as amended. Comments on that? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. Item number five, wood smoke reduction program for receipt. Move receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chair and Directors. And I'll just refer to uh, Lana Mullally, the General Manager, to introduce staff that will present this report. Welcome, Alana. Good evening. Thank you very much, Russell. Through Madam Chair to the Directors, the first um, item in these uh, three next reports, it will be presented by Daphne Mazarura. Daphne is our um, planning and po policy analyst. She'll be followed by Robin Holm, our long range planner, speaking to the Clean BC top up rebates, and then um, to Lisa Kilpatrick, who will be speaking to our Food Hub uh, report. Thanks, Russell. Over to you, Daphne. Thank you, Alana. Through the chair to the board, um, we're ready to launch our 2022 wood smoke reduction program. We have $89,000 available for rebates, and we are proposed. We the program will have three key changes. The first change um, is uh, a change in the rebate amounts. We're proposing a rebate amount to increase from $1,000 to $2,000. Um, high rebate amounts are an effective incentive, and this has been witnessed by our uptake through the Clean BC program. Furthermore, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy has made changes um, following an evaluation report for the Wood Smoke Exchange Program, and they have increased their rebate amounts. Secondly, we will discontinue fossil fuel heating appliance rebates. This aligns with the strategic driver for climate crisis and environmental stewardship and protection. This also follows um, the leadership of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, who have also um, included um, changes following the evaluation report and increased rebate amounts for heat pumps. And it also aligns with the residential retrofit acceleration strategies priority to accelerate home upgrades from natural gas to efficient air source heat pumps. And lastly, but not least, um, the program will include Hornby and Denman Island. And this is following the increased interest from Denman and Hornby Island residents to participate in the program. 
Also, we will present the communication plan for the wood smoke reduction program to the air shared round table. This alignment is needed as we receive the draft strategy for review. It has a high emphasis, important emphasis on fine particulate matter, PM 2.5 and wood smoke. So given the focus of much of the round table's discussion on wood, wood smoke and on this draft strategy, it's fitting that we provide you with a brief update on that project. So please note that we will be coming back to you probably end of March, April um, with the staff report for the strategy. So we received this draft strategy from the air quality coordinator before Christmas. Staff has reviewed it and we met with local government staff representatives from the round table. They have reviewed the draft and um, we have landed on a revised document. Um, and we will send it to the steering committee and the round table. We are aiming to do this by the end of this week. We will collect their feedback and make revisions as needed. And then come back to the board with the proposed wood smoke reduction strategy. We understand that the stakeholders and the round table have been anxious to see the strategy begin its rollout. And each government staff partner is committed to ensuring that the draft provides meaningful direction for implementation, particularly for each of the local governments. We believe that um, the extensive engagement of the roundtable has been necessary and foundational um, to enable alignment of the actions in the draft strategy and to set us up for a successful implementation and in turn to work, to work towards our goal of um, reducing PM 2.5 arising from indoor and outdoor wood burning. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. I have a question from Director Grief. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question basically is around the, uh, what we call the hot spots. Um, I know when we did the initial study, uh, it was uh, found that, that cellulose space 2.5 was really concentrated in a lot of the older areas um, in uh, in West Courtney and Cumberland and uh, and some in, in Comox as well in the older areas so um, we're talking about um, you know trying to uh, uh, make some progress um, in in those hot spots and I'm seeing we have uh, 28 rebates that went out um, last year. And I'm just wondering about the, the socioeconomic uh, uh, strata of the people taking the rebates and whether or not we're really affecting the areas that are the most of concern. Um, I'm wondering, uh, an engineer friend of mine told me you can't manage it if you can't measure it. So have we been able to measure our progress in those hotspots? Uh, is there some uh, evidence that we're actually uh, making headway on this? Through the chair to Director Grieve, thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, th those are a lot of uh, questions that have been raised by the roundtable and which we hope to achieve through the strategy as well. Um, and we were offering rebates for hotspot areas uh, following our findings from the mobile monitoring study. Since then, we have, haven't had that monitoring for hotspot areas. We still only have the, the one monitoring station in Courtney. Um, however, we do have uh, reports from the ministry for that for the results from that monitoring station and the most recent reports show that we we are now in an orange zone however we still need to um, we still need to focus on reducing um, pm 2.5 because even though we were in, a, in the orange zone for for one year we're still considered a red zone community however we we do hope that the draft strategy will uh, address the questions for a monitoring in the community. Thank you. 
that's one piece of the question. The other piece would be uh, that, uh, what does it show us uh, in the targeted area? I mean, if we have somebody, um, you know, there's a difference between somebody in a single wide trailer with an old 30 year old fixture stove, you know, a still burning wood and uh, somebody that's taking advantage of this rebate that, uh, you know, lives in say 20 acres in Merville, you know, where they're really not contributing too much to the issue, but you know, they're, they're taking advantage of the rebate. Are we able to target those rebates a little better to actually address the problem at hand? Thank you. Thank you for the chair to Director Grieve. Yeah, thank you again for that, uh, the question regarding um, the targeted approach for the hotspot areas. Um, will the hotspot areas we're targeting, um, well, the rebates for the, ho for the hotspot areas were created to try and, and target those areas of concentration. And there is also the equity piece to take into consideration. However, our rebates are still the same amount. And the only difference is with the appliance type. Um, again, that's something that can be considered in our work going forward. I'm not sure if Alan has anything else to add to that. Um, through Madam Chair, if I may, thank you, Daphne. I guess what I would say is that, you know, the, the focus of the wood smoke reduction program has historically been, and what we're bringing to you today is about reducing PM 2.5 in the dense areas of the areas where it is most concentrated and where it is, it would suggest that there is a, a negative health impact because of that concentration. Um, we haven't done a corollary assessment to look at the socioeconomic status of those who are um, heating with wood in those specific areas. Now, that's not to say that that can't happen. If that becomes an objective of the board to add or apply that lens, we haven't done that for 2022. But if it is the will of the board, certainly, then we could um, look back to see what kind of methodology we would design to collect that data and then in turn redesign the program with that as a similar objective. Thank you. Uh, Director Morin has a question. Um, well, I guess I'm going to be a bit repetitive because I, I um, thinking similarly to Director Grieve, um, I know we haven't specifically said we have an equity lens, but I think it's a valid point that um, I would like to see us helping people who really want to make the shift for the health of themselves and their neighbors, um, but maybe can't afford it. And maybe even um, bumping up rebates for, you know, having higher rebates based on socioeconomic um, uh, situations. And I know, you know, with our rec passes, we do gather that kind of information if we can do it in a respectful um, way um, so that we're really, um, helping the people that, that need it the most and who are in those hot spots. So um, I'll continue to listen to the discussion, but I also um, am feeling similarly that that's what I'd like to see. Thank you. Thank you. Dir Alternate Director Sullivan. Sure. Um, as someone who lives in one of these hot spots, I'm, I'm really happy to see this program um, come back and continue and improve. Um, I mean, the only way we can help these things is to buy trying to work towards solutions and uh, to see the rebates uh, get um, uh, get bigger is great. And I just hope we get some uptake from this new program. And um, I appreciate all the work that everyone's doing because it's a pretty hot spot up here. And uh, the fog tonight's making it a little bit worse too. So thanks for this. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Oh, Director Grant, please. Yeah. No problem. So I guess similar to uh, Edwin, I'm I'm looking at this and I'm <clears throat> I'm really wondering if we're hitting the hitting the right targets here. Um, you know, we only had twelve wood stoves go in, and, and, and I have often thought that, you know, if I was going to go get a heat pump, I go down to the store, the guy go, hey, run down to the RD, grab your rebate, and you can save a whole bunch of money. I was getting one anyway, right? So it it, it wasn't. Like you're not really doing anything when you do that. What I think you, where I think you win on this is when you go to some of these hotspots 
and you actually take out an old wood stove and replace it with something. Unfortunately, those people generally don't have the 10 or 15 or whatever thousand dollars it costs to make that change. So, you know, it would be really interesting to see the addresses of where these are going and whether it's just people taking free money from us or whether it's actually people that were actually changing out and, and fixing a bit of a problem here. You know, another thing that I've run into with heat pumps on this, because I suggested this program to a couple of guys, they had the guy come out and they, it wouldn't work in their house. They couldn't make it, they couldn't make it go for various different reasons. So it doesn't work for everybody either. So I don't know, I, I just think you need to either know the address or, or see in some way how you can get the people that you're actually trying to target, which are the guys with crappy old wood stoves out of their houses and 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 somehow upgrade. You know, like my little house, my wiring 70 amp. It, I can't put a heat, without redoing my whole wiring and everything, and it just becomes a, a massive job at that point. So anyway, those are my comments. Thanks, Director Grant. Uh, Director McCollum. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I had similar thoughts about this too. I mean, overall, I, I think that this is really kind of the best, perhaps, or close to the best solution that we have in front of us. It's hard to come up with the policy that applies across the community that does exactly what it's intended for. So I, I do feel like it is a bit of a balancing act of trying to see the fuel source switch and also recognizing that some of these rebates really are just reducing the cost of something that somebody was planning on doing regardless. And I, I don't know if there's an easy answer to solving that. Um, but I do wonder, just looking at how many wood stoves uh, were um, taken out last year versus um, the natural gas and that will no longer be uh, supporting that um, through a subsidy or a rebate, which I'm fully in support of. I wonder if because I, I mean, really, the the main goal here is to get as many wood stoves out of use and um, and a more uh, environmentally friendly um, heating source in our in our community. So, is there or has there? I guess my my question is, have we considered whether it would be better to have somewhat fewer rebates, um, perhaps that carry over and increase it from the 2000 just to ensure that it really is an incentive that'll see as many wood stoves come out next year as possible? Or do staff think it is more likely that we'll get a complete uptake with the numbers that we have and the rebate at the $2,000 as it's outlined? Thank you through the chair to Director McCollum. Thank you for your questions. Um, I, yeah, we, 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 have, uh, we have numbers for, from last year's uh, program and it does show an increase for, for heat pump uh, rebates because we only had three heat pump rebates uh, uh, take, given out last year and, and this year we had um, 11 in the hotspot area. So it did show an increase in the in the heat pump uh, rebate uptake, uptakes for that. And um, uh, in, I don't know if Alana has anything else to add. Um, thank you, Daphne. Uh, through Madam Chair to the directors, I guess a couple of things I would point to or, or speak to. So, um, again, it's about the objectives of the program. And so, so the objective for this program is to remove wood stoves. If the board wants to switch up the objectives from the program, we can do that. In respect to the natural gas piece, right, this is a bit of a test case. We know that for some, the shift, you know, for, for various reasons, if the electric heat pump is too expensive or difficult, uh, the feasibility pieces that Director Grant was speaking to, then the natural gas stove has provided that alternative to shift away from wood. And this is really just us floating an idea with you, uh, something that we see, where we see alignment with some of the other initiatives that we have going on, the climate crisis declaration of the board, and then also some shifts happening in the province, whereby, as Daphne said, uh, the climate secretariat is endeavoring to make some inroads into this long-standing wood smoke reduction program that's been offered through BC Lung Association and the Ministry of the Environment. 
I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, some of your feedback relates, uh, I think, around affordability and the feasibility. I'm hopeful that we can speak to some of that in the next report that's coming in front of you that will be presented by Robin, where she talks about, will be talking, pardon me, about the Clean BC um, top up rebates uh, for 2022. And that's where you get where when we start not to steal Robin's thunder or to dig in too much here, but where we start to see folks being able to match up those grants to really get the big dollar. Uh, incentive that can help tip them into that category of, you know, yes, we can do this as a household. One more thing uh, I would just suggest too, we, around the socioeconomic piece, from our housing needs assessment, we know that the houses, that the, the households that are living in the greatest extent of poverty are renter households. And so our work is to, in part, our outreach and education is to target the owners of those houses to encourage them to make these changes in their rental properties, thereby hopefully improving both health impact, pardon me, health outcomes, uh, and potentially also the monthly budget of their tenants. So, so complex. Uh, we're really keen to hear your feedback so that we can make these programs, you know, meaningful and accessible for for our residents. Thank you. Uh <laughs> That was a great uh, final comment, Alana. I had the same thought when I was reading through this report yesterday is that, you know, this is a great subsidy for homeowners, but it, it is renters in our community that are at the least advantaged, especially uh, given what we know about what's happened with property assessments. And if there's a way to find another lever that more of these rebates would go into homes that are occupied by renters as opposed to um, owners, that would be, um, I think, even, even a better use of the money. So thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, before I move on to Director Grieve, I had a question myself. Um, I recall staff bringing up an idea, um, it might have been a few years ago, about um, the regional district potentially providing um, loans up front for those households who couldn't afford to do a switch. And I'm just wondering if um, that might be included in the staff report that is coming up to us um, later on in the year if we could potentially look at um, a granting, pro not a granting program, but I'm guessing it's it's more of a loan that would then be paid back um, over time on, on the taxes and specifically targeting low income senior home, seniors who can't afford the upfront cost, but who would certainly benefit from having the, the fuel switch that we're, we're trying to encourage. And I don't know if staff want to comment on that or if, if that's even possible. Sure. Thank um, you. Oh, sorry, Daphne. Zoom is so hard, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, through the chair to the board, uh, just to briefly, I might not be able to speak to that, but this is a, it's a topic of discussion that has come up with the round table and with, in the preparation of the draft. Thank you. And I'll give it over to Alana. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne, through Madam Chair. Um, Director, or Chair Hamir, you're, you're right. This is something that's come around up around your table. And I believe Director Cole Hamilton has been very involved in looking at this um, PACE program. We did, uh, there was an opportunity released by FCM a couple of years ago around uh, grants for undertaking feasibility study work. Um, at the time, we were working closely with our Transition 2050 consultant, City Green, and we posed this question, you know, is, is this a worthwhile endeavor for us to pursue? And at that time, we sort of thought, look, um, there were a number of initiatives that we wanted to, to, to address. And so we thought, we'll let some of the other local governments do the feasibility study work and learn from them. So there are a couple of, there are a couple of Vancouver Island uh, communities that, are, that have done those feasibility study works. And so we'll be able to, to glean that. We also considered uh, with the advice of our City Green consultants that um, often, not always, but perhaps often, uh, folks who are in a home ownership situation have access to credit. So they can either access through their bank, a loan or, or credit line, et cetera. And so at the time, the feeling was that it wasn't, um, we didn't have uh, evidence at that point to suggest that this was the specific piece that, that residents were looking to local, local government to provide. But certainly uh, that, that could be um, something that emerges from these other feasibility studies uh, around the island that in fact, that is something that, that residents on the island are looking for. Thank you. Um, I see a uh, first time hand up for Director Cole Hamilton. 
Great, thank you, Chair. I was just going to respond to what uh, Elena was saying, and, and uh, based upon the work I've been doing through Pace BC and Help Cities Lead, the, the meetings I've had indicate to me that uh, Pace is coming. It will be happening, and it will be happening. Um, will be happening this year, and I uh, have sort of uh, anyway a, a sense of what the timing might be. But I think it's something. And I think the meeting we're having right now underscores the importance of a, a province-wide program like this. So we're not having to individually try to figure out a program that works to solve each of these problems in each community. Uh, and one of the, the, the elements of PACE is uh, very much along the lines of what Elena was saying is hopefully um, uh, building owners, landlords will be using those uh, resources to make their buildings more efficient. It's a very affordable way for that to happen. So, um, my, uh, yeah, my sense, and I can't probably say much more than this, is that it is coming and it's coming soon. And I think this will really help to fill that gap where rebates themselves just aren't enough to get people to the place that they can uh, afford to make the switch. And um, yeah, so we'll just uh, have to stay tuned on that. Thank you. We'll have to stay tuned, as you said. Director Gree. Yeah, just one more about the the sampling and and uh, and 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 measure te testing measures. Um, I know in in other jurisdictions like Christchurch, New Zealand, that they actually have like PM uh, two point five meters meters that actually you know go around and and if there's a problem, they actually knock on the person's door. So I mean, it it uh, seems to me we're kind of taking a loosey goosey kind of feel good almost like we're greenwashing our own program here because we're not really, uh, we're not able to measure the problem. And I'm just wondering um, how much does the equipment cost? We're working off figures, I think was from what, 2016 when they did that mobile testing. And, and we're going off the, the one air quality uh, 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 meter we have, I think at Courtney Elementary. So how much does it cost to get this kind of, uh, a technology it must be something you can hook up to your iphone by now <laughs> you know okay. and, and actually zero in on the problem and deal with the problem we have in the areas we have the problem thanks very much madam, madam chair i'd just like to respond to uh, what we are doing here and uh, and maybe back it up a little bit we celebrated tonight the fact that we have a new service it's called the mosquito abatement service for um for saratoga and what do mosquitoes have to do with air quality it reminds us of the steps that the regional district needs to take to really get involved in a service and 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 do it do it right. It takes time, feasibility studies, and ultimately, a service that is approved by the residents that will be paying for, for it. The programs that we're now providing with respect to the wood smoke and such are off the side of our desk. We don't have a formal service. If we are looking at really ramping up and undertaking the testing, the knocking on doors, the regulation and the requirements. The board is talking about a higher level of involvement that I think is leading you towards some form of service beyond what we are have the capacity to do now. So while it may seem as though we, our effects are not as great as you may want them to be, it is because it is off the side of our desk and, and not a specific service that the board has directed. Thanks for that comment. Um, Director Cole Hamilton, is that a new a hand up? Yeah, hands up again. Yeah, thank you. Um, just following on what I, I Russell, I, I fully appreciate what you're saying in investing in equipment and then following up on, on in sort of individual enforcement would be a huge step. I'm wondering if there's perhaps more of a middle ground step that could be taken place just to allow us to update the targeting we're doing. Again, we're working with those studies from was it 2015, that study that was done. Um, I'm assuming that this is a service that one uh, obviously someone from UBC drove a van around here. I'm wondering if it's possible to uh, have that done as a contract service that perhaps once per winter, we have a, um, um, we contract someone to do that. So we're not buying the equipment ourselves, but it would be helpful as we move from apparently a red zone to an orange zone. And as we start making efforts to see where we've made impacts and where we still need to go and, uh, uh, it strikes me there is definitely some value uh, in, in having updated information. And if there's an economical way that allows us to contract out that that's the acquisition of that information without having to take, um, that strikes me that that'd be a good step in terms of fine tuning where we want to uh, increase or, or target uh, 
the grant program. I don't know if that is a possible, if the, the, that is a service that can be uh, sort of acquired on a sort of a rental or a contract basis. Yeah, I think um, for the board's consideration, we're talking about the wood smoke reduction program and, and uh, requesting um, you know, your consideration of that. And it will be the uh, the report that Alana referred to coming back to you with the recommendations and your, your opportunity at that time to decide that to what level you want to get in. And then staff can advise you as to, yes, this is something we can continue without having a service or no, we really are going down the, 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 the ropes of a of something more formal that you need to go to the electors and get their consent and establish the uh, the resources, whether they're contracted or owned by the regional district that are that are paid for and function through that that service. Okay, thanks, Russell. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up, um, so let's move on. Receive. Is anyone opposed to receiving the uh, the Wood Smoke Reduction Program report? Hearing and seeing none. That's approved. We have, we have a recommendation that's been moved. Second. Seconded. And is there any discussion on the recommendation? Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I was noticing when reading through the Green New Deal uh, that was brought to us a little while ago that this particular, what we're discussing right now, was uh, one of the in-progress items uh, that was listed. And it's impressive that at the very next meeting we can actually tick this off as having been largely completed and the, the item in question there was a, just a very small amendment to the, res, to the recommendation I wanted to make just to fully capture what was being asked for there and the request was simply that uh, we recognize that natural gas is a fossil fuel and I think that's implicit in the entire report uh, but it's not specifically stated and I think if we could just add after heating device brackets natural gas, uh, end bracket, I think that would uh, provide greater clarity uh, in terms of what specific uh, fossil fuel we're speaking of in this situation, and it would uh, achieve the goal of, of making that recognition explicit. Uh, so I was just going to ask if those two words in brackets could be added after heating device to the resolution. I'm not seeing heating device on this, on this recommendation. Could it, is it for the clean BC one? Because so what I see is that the 2022 wood smoke reduction program outlined in the staff report dated January 19th, 2022 be approved. Do we have a different recommendation maybe? We could put comma and that the board recognized that fossil fuels, uh, sorry, uh, to your to your recommendation. If I may, Madam Chair, I think it's uh, maybe Dr. Cole Hamilton's referring to the options where the board has the following options proceed with staff recommendation to discontinue, discontinue rebates for fossil fuel heating appliances and only re offer rebates for heat pump. That's in the report on page three. But but I think the uh, the overall motion is not for the report. It, it, inside the report, the overall motion just asks us not to vote on those options, but just to accept the report. And in, implicit in that is option one. Thank you for deciphering what I was saying, Direct, Director Arbor. Um, given that that's not within the wording of the recommendation, then I'll just withdraw that, uh, that potential amendment. But I think it, this, uh, by passing this recommendation, we would be implicitly recognizing that uh, we see uh, natural gas as a fossil fuel. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Director Greaves on the recommendation. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, Director Greaves. Oh, Director Greaves, you're still muted. We haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Probably came up on my screen. I don't know why, but no, I think we got to remember that this this is all about wood smoke reduction. We're 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 getting we're drifting into the whole climate crisis argument. We're talking about PM two point five, which is a health issue that needs to be addressed on its own. So you know, it's all it's all great, but I think um, natural gas, you know, it doesn't make two point five, doesn't produce that. So just keep to the the question. 
Thanks to Director Grieve. I, I, I hear the point about wood smoke, but I also would push back that climate change certainly had an impact on my health in 2021. So also a health issue, but different. Uh, Director Cole Hamilton, did you have another question? Oh, no. Um, okay. Sorry, yes. I, I, um, I was just going to say that, I mean, climate change does come into this because the very reason that we're now precluding uh, natural gas devices is because of climate change, because it is one of our drivers and it makes uh, perhaps not much sense to be installing new uh, devices of that nature. Um, if uh, anyway, I just wanted to make that reference and, and clarify that link for Director Gree. Thank you. All right, on the question of the recommendation, is anyone opposed to the recommendation as presented? Hearing and seeing none, that's approved. Moving on to the clean top up, clean VC top up. Moved and seconded, and over to staff. Go ahead, Robin. Okay, thank you. Um, through Madam Chair and to the directors, um, we are here tonight to provide you with an update on the uptake of the 2021 Clean BC rebate top-up program and also to seek approval for the allocation of $30,000 in grant funding towards the 2022 program. Just to provide you with a little bit of um, history or context, the province launched their Clean BC rebate program in 2018, with this program offering rebates for homes um, up to $3,000 to convert from fossil fuel heating systems to electric heat pumps. Municipalities have the opportunity to opt in to an additional um, program. This is the municipal top-up program where we offer um, top-up incentives. The CVRD has participated in this program since 2018 and has contributed to a total of $48,000. In 2021, we saw a higher rebate uptake than previous years. Um, Clean, BC, uh, Clean BC reported that there were 108 households in the Comox Valley that made the fuel switch upgrades. The CVRD provided an additional $2,000 for heat pumps and $500 uh, for electrical service upgrades. This was the first year that the CVRD opted into the higher rebate amount. And what we saw from this was that the program was fully subscribed by June 2021. This surge in uptake be attributed to a number of factors, one being the increased rebate amount. Uh, we, like, I, like I just mentioned, we offered $2,000 compared to um, the usual amount of $350. The province al also offered a limited double the rebate offer, and this was offered in the first half of the year. Um, so where um, participants would normally be um, uh, they would have $3,000 that they would be eligible for. They were now eligible for $6,000. Um, some other factors could be the growing awareness of the available rebate programs and the recognition that heat pumps are a climate-friendly heating and cooling option. Um, and, and finally, the last factor could be the growing and maturing heat pump industries that we have in our community. This uptake in fuel switching indicates an important shift from fossil fuel heating to electric heat pumps. According to the 2017 GHD emissions inventory, residential buildings that consume natural gas and oil contribute to 71% of the residential emissions in the Comox Valley. To achieve the CBRD GHD reduction targets, this will require 3% of households annually to make the transition to renewable energy. Therefore, to accelerate the electrification of residential heating and to implement the Transition 2050 Residential Market Acceleration Strategy, staff are recommending that the, that the CVRD continue its participation in the top-up program and that the board support allocating $30,000 in grant funding to be used for the 2022 program. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. And we have a question from Director Arbor. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the report and the program. Um, so where to start here? Um, I guess, yeah, that's great to see the, uh, the um, Transition 2050 uh, being put in context and also acknowledging that um, as, as written in, in the report, um, some of those RGS targets that we have fallen behind. I have, I have, I'll need, like when this comes back, I'm, I'm kind of scared to be honest in regards to the air quality round table and this type of work, because I'm kind of scared that if it's, if what comes back is not enough to help us reach 
for example, that goal of uh, helping switch over 3% of homes, you know, we may have to uh, look at um, more ambitious strategies, but I don't know. Or we'll see what comes back uh, both for the transition 2050 update and the, the, the air quality roundtable. But here's my, here's my main point. If we have a goal of 3% of homes, there's about 25,000 dwellings in the Comox Valley. So this would be about, we would need to switch over. And again, I, I don't have the stats necessarily on how many homes need to be switched. So there, arguably there's a lot that are already on heat pumps, but I don't have that number. But say that I lowball that 780 and we call, call it 500 homes a year that would need to be switched over. Um, we're currently doing between those two program about 30 homes out of that 600. You know, it would require to our to our CEO's point, if we were going to provide subsidies to reach that target, we would probably need about six hundred thousand dollars a year in subsidies to help reach the three percent target. So then my mind drifts to other. Uh, avenues to try to reach that target of 3%, which I'm sure will be outlined in the strategy that we'll receive. But my mind drifts really quickly to regulatory means. So we saw the town of Comox and the village of Cumberland um, ban wood stoves in new construction. And I don't think that's very viable in rural areas because of power outages, but we could require the installation of heat pumps in new construction. I don't know if to what extent that would help us get closer to the 3% goal, because that would not help with the retrofitting of homes. And that's why later on in the agenda, we receive a presentation from Carbon and I'm, I'm looking for things that may get us at scale, or is our intent to just grow a subsidy program to the, you know, maybe the $600,000 level in subsidies. All I'm trying to say is we're well short of our goal uh, in, in terms of what we're currently achieving. Um, so to Director Greaves' point, are we just putting a nice smile right now? I think we'll need to throw the gauntlet at it. I think we will need all the programs and tools available, the PACE program, maybe that kind of carbon credit program, subsidy program to Director Moray and Director Greaves, Maybe the subsidy program is better targeted at low-income households. Um, so a lot of questions. So I'm just throwing out there, that out there because I know there'll be a couple of reports coming back in the next couple of months, but I, I'll be really curious to see as to whether we get some regulatory tools thrown in the mix as well. Thank you. Thanks for that, Director Arbor. I don't know if uh, staff wanted to respond to that. Um, through the chair to Director Arbor, I can just, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but we're, we're trying to become um, really um, familiar with all of the rebate programs that are out there so that we're able to advise homeowners of the opportunities that are there. Um, there are opportunities to stack these rebate programs, and we're really looking to cross-promote our program. So we will be looking at opportunities to cross promote with the wood smoke reduction program. So aligning our programs to ensure that we are targeting um, the same, the same, having the same objective, switching out those fossil fuel heating systems and replacing them with the heat pumps. And so um, homeowners will be able to access uh, the wood smoke reduction um, rebate, as well as the clean BC rebate, as well as the CVRD municipal top-up rebate, as well as the BC hydro electrification rebate. So we're hoping that there's going to be a bit of a tipping point here with all of the access to these rebates that where it would have been um, completely unattainable and, and unaffordable for those homeowners, they now have access to, to the financial means to make those uh, upgrades. I think Director Arbor has a further question. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I totally get what your what staff is saying on this. Um, I, I'm not saying we should uh, not pursue that avenue, but mm -hmm. I guess Elon Musk has has that uh, that saying around uh, convergent thinking. You know that uh, that you start focusing as the resources and the things that are available in those programs, and yeah, you're doing a great job of stacking. But in the big picture, are you actually 
resolving the problem that you're seeking to resolve. And what I'm trying to say is, if our approach is to stack all these different resources that are mostly provincially or otherwise provided through a subsidy program, what I'm asking is a pathway to get to the 3% target of switch over each year, right? So that would take a lot of subsidy and a lot of financial resources in those subsidies. You, you already said that we ran out of subsidy by June, right? And mm -hmm. we're achieving about a 5% through that program uh, of the target we're aiming for. And again, my number may be off because I don't have the exact number that is required to reach our RGS target. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, yeah, if we're just achieving 5% with the resources and we're stacking all these resources, that's where my mind drifts to what, how we're going to address the 95% of conversion that needs to happen. And that's what I expect or hope to see once we receive the strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, to Director Arbor's point, I, I, I'm aware that the um, City of Courtney just passed a few um, resolutions just recently to the extent asking staff to um, consider, you know, closer monitoring of um, air quality levels. And apologies, this probably is more to the, the previous um, item around wood smoke. Um, are staff aware of, of those uh, resolutions that just occurred? Uh, through Chair Hamir, yes, we are, and that's the benefit of doing um, this um, this work under the Regional Growth Strategy Service. Um, we do have active participation um, with Courtney staff, and so we recently met to talk about how they envision uh, acting on their council's directions. Okay. I mean, it, it sounds like a regulatory piece um, to Director Arbor's just question just that happened, sort of, kind of. It's more of a, a stick. It's a target, but you know, when we don't have targets um, ourselves and we're not measuring, as Director Grief mentioned, we don't know where we are. So, um, possibly something to bring up at electoral areas um, where we have a, a little bit more latitude. So, um, thanks for, for that. I don't see any other questions. Uh, so, on receipt then of the report, uh, is anyone opposed? And that is carried. We have a recommendation to approve the allocation of the $30,000 from Island Health. Moved. Second. And seconded. And are there any comments or questions on the recommendation? Hearing and seeing none, that's approved. Item number seven, Food Hub Stewardship Group meeting, terms of reference. Move it. Moved and seconded. And over to staff, please. Uh, Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks. Through Madam Chair to the Directors, in uh, September of last year, you received the Food Hub Feasibility Study, and as part of that, uh, approved the move to step one of the implementation phase, and that included the creation of a committee to move forward on laying the foundation, foundational work for the next steps for the Food Hub. So staff has prepared the terms of reference for what we are calling stewardship group. This will be a working group that will come together to lay the foundation for the startup of a food hub and, and determine whether or not we there is support and funding available for us to move into the, the startup phase of a food hub. We intend to uh, launch the application process for the stewardship group at the end of this week. And the application process will close uh, February 23rd and we'll review the, ap the applications and intend to bring uh, nominations for recommendation to the board in March. So I'll just pause there. I know it's a long meeting for you guys, so I won't go through the materials and details. Any comments or questions to you, staff? Uh, Director Grief? Yeah. Um Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, I'm looking forward to this uh, proceeding, of course, you know, coming from uh, mainly an agricultural area. But I noticed that um, you've got a, a call out there for people from, you know, a, a broad spectrum of the agriculture and retail community, and probably uh, North Island College as well. And 
a lot of these people are very busy people. I'm just wondering, is there some small stipends or some kind of compensation that's available uh, for them to actually join this, or is it strictly going to be volunteer basis? Uh, through Madam Chair to Director Greve, that's a, a great question, and, and it isn't something that we have contemplated at this point. I think that uh, we are, we will be obviously observing the applications that we get in and the feedback that we hear from people once we put out the application process. And uh, I think that depending on um, on how we proceed, if uh, if we aren't receiving applications, then we will need to explore what those barriers may be. And you know, a, a stipend might uh, be an appropriate incentive at that point. Thanks for that. Um, Lisa, I have a question around um, the membership of the group. I'm just wondering how much weight um, staff are going to put on when you get applications to potential end users of the of a food hub. Um, is, is that going to be an uh, of interest or do you see that um, being uh, a necessity? Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that we were really looking for skills, a skill set and participation from folks who will be uh, directly uh, impacted by this food hub. And certainly uh, that is both the folks who, who supply the food hub and folks who would be purchasers uh, from the food hub. So we really need to understand both that supply and demand side and see that representation on the, the committee to, I believe, be able to move forward with a, with a fulsome uh, business plan to, uh, to a function uh, for a functioning food hub. That's great. So you're gonna be putting a question or in the application form to whether or not people will be an end user or considering? Uh, the, the question that we have framed for the application is uh, what is their connection to uh, businesses and the community around um, the agricultural sector and the food and service beverage sector. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I don't see other questions. I, ha I do have one more. Um, Lisa, there was the, the Food Hub Feasibility Study that we were given um, did ha highlight a specific site for the Food Hub to, to take place and, you know, a fairly large infrastructure that had to go in supporting that, that site. Um, is the group still considering, is that the only option? My concern is that um, the actual people who are willing to put this, their skin in the game and, and pay to be a member is not matching what the the feasibility study actually portrayed? I think that the, the feasibility was a, um, a relevant document to determine uh, the possibility and the opportunity for a food hub in, in the Comox Valley. It was a point in time. And I think that uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get a membership on the stewardship group uh, of folks who will be able to be analytical um, and will be able to uh, question and be pragmatic about what the what the demands are and and how uh, the supply can meet that. And so I think that from there we will see uh, recommendations around facilities that really match. I think what a, a realistic business model is. Super glad glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions uh, on receipt, is anyone opposed? And that is carried. We have a recommendation. Second. Moved by Director Hillian. And sorry, did you catch us who the second was? Was that Director Cole Hamilton? Did you second? Director Grieve. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. That the Comox Valley Regional District approves the terms of reference for the Food Hub Stewardship Group. Any comments? Hearing and seeing none, is anyone opposed? And that is carried. Item number eight, the Union Bay Water Serval Parcel Tax Bylaw number 697 for receipt. Moved. Second. And second, thank you, and over to staff. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors, and Keely Lambert, our Engineering Analyst, is here just to give a brief uh, presentation as to why we're bringing this uh, parcel tax bylaw forward. Keely. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm introducing my CF report to reintroduce the parcel tax bylaw for Union Bay Water Service. The current parcel tax bylaw expired at the end, the end of 2021, and, we're, and a new one will be required to collect, collect parcel taxes in the Union Bay Water Service. Uh, changes made include adding definitions found in other bylaws and other minor changes to bring it more in line with our other, uh, other parcel service by bylaws and removal of unnecessary language on payment installations. Great, short and sweet. Okay, we have a <laughs> Director Arbor. Uh, yeah, I'm about to sour it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a bit uh, not surprised, but um, I guess this didn't usually our things go through EASC, but I think this one is coming directly to the board. Um, and I do have some discomfort with it to have to do that in front of the board, but uh, I'm not sure I can support this uh, because of number 2C. Uh, there's been a long uh, conversation as part of the conversion process with the past trustees around the differentiation between parcel A's and B's. And this would, um, this writes the parcel tax to be levied in 2022 is 390 on all parcels of land for group A and $0 on all parcels of land and plus funded to group B. And I think there's general support in Union Bay for bringing parcel B's uh, into a paying mode. So, I have difficulty, the rest of the bylaw is fine, but the fact that we're setting the budget in this bylaw, when I'm not able to consider the overall budget of the water service is problematic for me. I know it's gonna come up next month. So my question is, can this be deferred to a future meeting? That's a question to staff. Kaylee, are you able to respond? And is this bylaw different than it was last year with that, with respect to the uh, the parcels as presented? And then JK it should be identical. Oops, sorry. It, it should be sure. identical to uh, what was presented last year. This is more or less um, the 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 same uh, the same mechanisms and and referring to the same things. I've just uh, referred. There was no previous definitions in place, but I found them and have incorporated them in the document to make it clearer. Great, okay, thanks. And um, Madam Chair, I see Kevin DeVille has his hand up as well. He may have some insight and Jake Martins is here as well. So I'll just refer to Kevin first and then Jake. Thank you very much, Russell, through the chair to Director Arbor. Uh, yes, just wanted to kind of raise a couple of points with respect to this bylaw. So firstly, I mean, the reason it's, it's coming to the board this evening is we do need to have it in place ahead of our upcoming parcel tax review panel that is scheduled to take place on February the 23rd. Um, I also do want to assure Director Arbor that we, at that parcel tax review panel, we do intend to bring back a, a brief summary report that speaks to the issue of the um, Group A and Group B parcels. I mean, we, we do have to recognize that as part of this conversion, there are a number of bylaws that we did inherit as part of that, that uh, take, takeover of, of the improvement district, most notably their eighth uh, assessment bylaw and their capital expen uh, expenditure charge bylaw all that interlink and speak to these group A and group B parcels. Staff's intent is to certainly take a look, a, a fulsome look at those group Bs uh, over the course of this year and come back with recommendations as to which parcels that currently make up that portion of, of their role that could be brought into the group A's. I mean, right now, based on the definitions of, of the eighth assessment bylaw of, of the improvement district, uh, those Group B parcels are classified as any parcel that is considered unserviceable or untaxable. And when I speak to untaxable, that means there's a significant number of properties in there, such as Crown land and other similar types of land that don't uh, have tax applied to them. Uh, we, we certainly do intend to see if there are any parcels that have the potential uh, of being provided water and therefore could be eligible for a parcel tax. Um, but we certainly would like to undertake that, that fulsome review of that um, and bring those recommendations back to the directors at that time. Thanks. And it sounds like everything's been covered. Director Arbor, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just feel um, trying to keep in check my Frenchness here, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm just feeling a little bit cornered and having to approve this bylaw because we haven't completed the work that I was expecting that we would. Again, this should have come to ESC 
at, le at least with a heads up for consideration, because I'm not quite sure what I'm voting on in regards to uh, the impact on the budget. Um, and I also realize the time pressure. So I guess this would defer that whole parcel A and B in my mind, even though Kevin tried, I think, to give me some signals between the lines that there's some things in the work, but I, I don't have that knowledge. So I guess that would kick it to the 2023 budget in terms of parcel A and B, which takes us in, into a, a different term after the next election. So. I would have loved to solve that one today um, or actually at the last ESC meeting. Um, you're under pressure because the parcel tax um, meeting is coming up, I guess, in a couple of weeks. So you need to get this done. So can I go back to Union Bay and explain that? I guess I can. So I won't hold it up for the benefit of the board. Maybe just a question to staff, if it was deferred to the first EASC meeting um, and we spoke and I guess approved it there, would it, or whatever, amended it there, would that still give you enough time for um, the review, review board? Thank you, Chair. Uh, and Kevin, please uh, jump in here if I get this wrong, but um, I think that the, the only opportunity potentially is whether this was deferred uh, and then it was all four regions of the bylaw were given at the next board meeting, but, um, Certainly, you know, we, we don't uh, often want to try that, of course, because we prefer it be considered at subsequent meetings, but uh, but that would be the only potential option. Uh, Kevin, if that works out as far as your scheduling for the parcel tax review panel. Uh, through the chair to uh, the directors. Um, yes, I mean, I'll concur with Jake. Uh, the reason for the short time frame is we would need to have uh, this budget, uh, sorry, this bylaw adopted by no later than February the 8th to ensure that the role can be properly authenticated at the February 23rd uh, partial tax review panel. So that does, that does unfortunately uh, you know, leave us all you know, uh, a little lack of time to, to, to be able to uh, uh, you know, kind of deal with this item. I wonder then if this even gives us enough time to really go over that um, bylaw properly. Uh, yeah, director, uh, director. Again, I, I already said I, I would let it go and I, uh, It'll go to 2023, but um, yeah, I think I made my point. Um, there's still people, just a quick question. Um, so hopefully the board's okay with that, but a quick question that this is the, the really softball, but I know that residents in Union Bay still wonder why they pay a parcel tax. So Kevin, can you explain the role of the parcel tax in the service of uh, the water? Uh, through the chair to Director Arbor. Yeah, I'll just certainly do my best. Um, so the parcel tax, uh, it is levied on all those parcels um, that, that either have an active water connection or have the potential of having an active water connection. And those funds are put into a dedicated reserve, uh, both when it was an improvement district and certainly our intent now as, as a regional district service to put that into a reserve to pay for any future upgrades to that water system. So that's really the impetus of that. The, the, the user rates or the water tolls that are charged within that service are then used to support the ongoing operational costs associated with delivering water uh, to that community. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Uh, on receipt, the report for the Union Bay Water Parcel uh, Tax Bylaw. Is anyone opposed? And that's carried. We have a recommendation. Moved by Director Arbor. Second by Director Grant. Comments, questions? It's a vote of the full board. Is anyone opposed? And that's carried. Item number nine, the update to the Comox Valley Regional District Signing Authorities for receipt. Moved and I can second over to staff. Yeah, it's just a minor amendment to the uh, signing authorities and it's to recognize the new manager of financial planning that is part of the uh, organization. Thank you for that. Any comments, questions? On receipt then, is anyone opposed? And that's carried. And we have a recommendation. Move the recommendation. Moved and seconded. Comments? Hearing and seeing none. That is carried. Moving on to bylaws and resolutions. We are at uh, bylaw number 675, the Comox Valley Exhibition Ground Fees and Charges Bylaw number 244 for first and second. Moved and seconded. Comments? Director Grieve. Yeah, I'm sorry I mentioned this earlier, but um, the last time we, we talked about this, uh, there was 
I had some concern and I raised the concern at the, the at the uh, commission that um, that perhaps uh, utility costs like hydro and water should be a flow through so that we're not subsidizing those fixed utility costs at a time when everybody else in the province has to pay them. Obviously, BC Hydro being a crown corporation does not give the regional district any, any discounts. So I'm just wondering how that's been factored into the fees and charges. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm sure no, no changes have been made uh, since this was at the uh, Comox Valley uh, Rec Commission. Um, we will come back to the commission with respect to Director um, Agree's um, um, comments and suggestions and just uh, address the hydro, hydro fees and, and such at a later meeting. Thank you for that. Any other questions? So on first and second reading, is anyone opposed? And that's carried. Third reading moved. Someone jump in. We need a second. Second, thank you, Director Arver. Uh, anyone opposed? And that's carried. Item number two, bylaw number 690 for first and second. Moved and seconded. Uh, comments? This is a vote of the areas. Is anyone opposed? And that's carried. Third reading for 690 has been moved and seconded. And anyone opposed? And that is carried. Item number three, CVRD uh, adjudication ticketing bylaw number 679 for first and second. Second. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any comments? A vote of the areas. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And third reading has been moved and seconded. Any comments? And that is carried. I think we're going to skip down now to number, is it number nine? Oh, sorry, we just have to, no, we, oh, we didn't do G4. Okay, G4, Union Bay Water Service Parcel Tax Bylaw number 697 for first and second reading. Moved and seconded. Anyone opposed? Vote of the full board. And that's carried. Third reading has been moved. Second. Second by Director Sullivan. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Now we can skip. Item number nine. Is it nine? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Union Bay Fire Protection Service Regulation Bylaw number 688 for adoption. Second. Moved and seconded. Comments, questions? Hearing and seeing none. That is approved. Item number 10. The Offer officers and employees indemnification bylaw number 237 for Move adoption. It. Move it. Director Grieve and Director Grant, comments? Hearing and seeing none, anyone opposed? And that's carried. And then lastly, we've got the electoral area of parks regulation bylaw number 103 for adoption. Moved by Director Grant. Second. Second, Director Cole Hamilton. And we have a comment by Director Arbor. I'd like to welcome the municipalities to the service. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? It's a vote of the areas. Uh, hearing <laughs> anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, and that is carried. Uh, would folks like a stretch break before we move on to new business, or do you want to move through? Let's finish. Okay, thank you. Uh, under new business, we have a request letter of support for private bill, private members bill number C-216 for receipt. Thank you. Director Hillian. Second. And Director Cole Hamilton. And I'm gonna move it over to staff or? I think uh, Director Arbor can introduce it and then I'll have a comment or a recommendation. Great, thanks. Director, oh, oh I think this. No, nope. nope. this is maybe Director Morin is speaking to. Yeah. Yes, Director Morin. Sorry. Go ahead. 
I wasn't sure what order we were doing things in if staff wanted to speak first, but I did have a conversation with Chair Kettler, who is not able to be here tonight, who had put this forward. So would you like me to proceed with some yes, comments yes. first or staff first? No, I think you can go ahead. Okay. So I, I know she was hoping to be here to speak on behalf of this resolution. And um, I think that uh, it's really clear in the request that the, um, the federal drug policies that we've, we've had to date have not been adequate to address the mountain crisis that we're in on this, um, on this issue. And um, I really took to heart the, uh, the comments in the, in the letter, um, uh, Dr. Um, Smith, uh, criminalizing people who use drugs, stigmatizes substance use, fosters a climate in which they feel unsafe and accessing life-saving interventions and treatment and further marginalizes those living in poverty or at social disadvantage. So of course, this is, um, this is in support of a private member's bill um, being put forward by MP Gordon Johns. Um, and I really, I really think there, there is a lot of support for some significant change. And I believe this is an, an issue that impacts all of our communities. Um, and I think that we, we talk a lot about stigma and reducing stigma and, and all of that. But um, when something is criminalized, there can be no reduction of stigma. I mean, that um, we, we just can't destigmatize something that's illegal. So um, it also, I think, Marg further marginalizes people who are more visible in the community who use substances. So we know that there's many, many people behind closed doors who are not visible, who, um, who this applies to as well. And, and yet all the attention goes to often people who are unhoused, who, um, who bear the brunt of, of, um, of this uh, criminalization. So I, uh, I hope everyone will support this. Um, there are people across the country, Union of Police Chiefs, um, all the top medical officers, coroners association. Um, there's a lot of support. And I think that our support would get this help to get this on the floor and then it can be debated. And then all the nuances of this can be discussed. But I think that getting it on the floor for discussion is really important and that we can help to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, I mean, we can't do anything if it's not on the floor. So I'm hopeful that um, people will support this. I know that this has touched a lot of people um, and that's all I'll say, thanks. Thanks, Director Maureen. And there's a, a number of hands. Did Seth want to add anything else? No, nothing to add to this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll first go to Director Sullivan and then Director Arbor. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just for the information of the board, um, Cumberland Council last night uh, passed a motion to write to the Minister of Health and Addictions, uh, Carolyn Bennett and the Prime Minister supporting this bill. And I would implore the board, board as well to support this bill. Um, just following on to what um, Dr Director Warren said, um, I mean, all the things that this country is doing to prevent these deaths and such um, aren't working. So we need a progressive, brand new approach nationwide. And this is the start of it, hopefully. So thank you. Thank you, Director Arbor. Yeah, this is a really worthwhile resolution. and. There's actually quite a lot of momentum in Ottawa around this, as Dr. Moray uh, talked about. I think there's been a huge shift in the thinking around the substance uh, crisis. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm quite confident that, uh, that our MP Gore Jones is, is going to be successful in, in uh, getting this to the finish line as he's done with other files. Um, I think the climate is right. And I think the Liberal Party the, the, is, is going to be. Uh, welcoming this uh, resolution as well. Thank you. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I just want to thank Director Moran for her words introducing this. Just something small I wanted to add is when uh, MP Johns came to the, uh, the Substance Use Committee, um, there were a lot of people who wanted him to uh, 
move to legalization rather than decriminalization. And that's certainly, that's a view that's widely held and, and I can, can see where that comes from. Um, Gord's response was that he felt that there was political will to support criminalization and to go one step at a time and to begin to open the debate and begin the discussion. And while this may not be everything uh, that, that might be necessary to really address the issue, it, it's, a, it's a very strong step. And uh, I just uh, thank Gord Johns for putting this on the, on the floor of the house. And uh, this has my wholehearted support. Thank you, Director Cole Hamilton. And I'll just say, uh, I also wanna thank uh, Direct, or MP Gord Johns for, for moving this forward. It's always a lottery to see who um, is able to put forward a private member's bill. And I think we as a region just got lucky this, this year and just wanna thank him for moving this, um, this issue forward. I don't see any other hands up uh, on receipt. Is anyone opposed? And that's carried. And we Please have a request. Moved and seconded that the Comox Valley Regional District Board write to the Federal Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and the Prime Minister of Canada, supporting private members bill C216 being an act to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act and to enact the expungement of certain drug related convictions act and the National Strategy on Substance Abuse, Substance Use Act. Any other comments or questions? I'll call the question, is anyone opposed? And that is carried. Thanks everybody. Uh, item number two, a follow-up to the Carbon Sense Technologies uh, de delegation for receipt. Moved Second. and seconded. And I'm gonna move it over to Director Arbor who presented the, the letter. Thank you. And uh, gauging by staff's comment today, I think requested action Two is pretty much looked after already, but it doesn't hurt to still have it there. This is in follow-up with a great presentation from Carbon Sense. Uh, they're applying for um, some funding in order to explore the role, the potential role of uh, carbon credits in the heat pumps uh, space, which we broadly discussed tonight. So this is just basically to write the letter of support that's uh, that's attached and. Uh, and the rest, I think, will be carried through uh, our regular work with the Transition 2050 uh, Retrofit Strategy. I don't know if uh, CEO wants to add to that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors. And my advice would be that, uh, yes, to, to consider and uh, the, the requested action number two, by all means, and have a resolution. My one comment was being just to caution you on supporting a single business on their initiative. So I'm a little nervous about requested action number one, writing a letter of support for carbon sense a business. And just wonder whether uh, when staff report back on the work and the activities, maybe you consider at that time, whether any other technology service businesses or other means to implement the, the suggestions that they had before you. Thank you for that comment. I think Director Arbor has a response. Um, thanks, I mean, I, I, um, I didn't expect that in, in the sense that the, the, the letter is very general. Uh, they are applying for federal funding. And so um, knowing those programs, I'm sure that due diligence will be done at the federal level in regards to their policies. And, and our letter is, is very, um, yeah, very general. It's not, it doesn't commit the regional district to any uh, other action. Great, thanks. Director Grief. Thank you very much. Um, there's the other alternative. When you're talking about a low carbon, we are zeroing in on heat pumps. And I understand because heat pumps take one watt of energy and turn it into three watts of cooling or, or heating because of the way it works. But um, obviously there's other sources uh, of, of, of zero emission uh, heating systems like the new baseboards out there. They're much more higher efficient than the old ones. So baseboard heating should be included as well if it's going to be shifting from carbon intensive uh, uh, heat sources. Heat pump is not the be all and end all of everything. It's a good technology, but why are we signaling out heat pumps? We're kind of you know throwing our, 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 our lot in with, with a, a certain industry. That's all I'm saying. Thank you for that comment. Dr. Arbor, you have a light on? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, this is the, the, the presentation that we all received was, was um, around a specific initiative and a specific proposal. And by all means, I welcome any and all initiatives that will actually help us deliver on our, our goals of emissions reductions rather than just talking about it. I believe that um, something innovative like this, which is untested, uh, is, is worthwhile to encourage constituents who try to open up space to actually um, gain scale. And, and I think that this, this idea of helping homeowners, um, as we discussed last time, to um, generate some income from, um, from their energy savings is, is worthwhile. So um, I'm encouraging the board to vote in favor. Thank you for that comment. I don't see any other hands up. So first of all, on receipt, is anyone opposed? And that's carried. And then we have requested action number one, which is the, the letter of support. Is the that, that's moved and seconded. And, and Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. Just a minor quibble with the wording. Uh, the first paragraph is not actually an action. Uh, it, uh, it, it's probably the whereas. <clears throat> and uh, the second paragraph is effectively the action. So um, I don't know if it matters in terms of it being passed, but uh, I just want to make that comment. Staff are seem to be okay with it. Yeah. Thank you. But thanks for pointing that out. Any other comments, Director Grant? Yeah, I guess... Um... Just in, in the part of it where we're going to support a single business, I agree with Russell. This comes up at the municipalities a lot more than it does in the regional district. We probably deal with this a couple of times a year. We've got one in front of us right now. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that it's even legal to support a business over. Like, we can't be seen as supporting one business over another. We can support, in general, what he wants to do. But, I, you know, I agree with you on that, that we're sort of being really specific to one business. And, and that's there's a, I'm not even sure if it's legal to do that, to be honest with you. I wonder if I could ask uh, staff to clarify the difference between a letter of support and then supporting a business directly, if there's a legal difference. here. It, yes, there probably is. I think it's just a good thing to avoid. <laughs> and I think if we move back to a previous delegation that came for uh, so it was a telecommunications uh, company and they wanted specific support and the recommendation of staff was support the objective but not the company right just avoid uh, any, uh, aligning yourself with single companies and i guess m my other point in this is the action in number two staff are going to come back with the status of transition and the actions that could be considered what if this is not a priority action what if there are others i think just wait until you receive that information before you endorse any particular initiative or not. So you have the full context of it. And in that way, you also avoid supporting a single business. Director Arbor. Okay, first off, I, I did get staff to uh, review and provide input into the letter. And I think they put that lens uh, in the same spirit as what we did with TELUS. So this, in my opinion, was vetted by staff or unless I've been fooled. The second is it's 2022. Right. I just spoke earlier how our program is um, meeting about less than 5% of the annual need in terms of the GHG emission reduction in retrofits. We have eight years, right? Uh, there's a program open that closes in mid-February. This is a general letter of support to uh, an outfit, and they may be a nonprofit. I still haven't verified that. But even if they're a business, that's that's okay too. I mean, it, it's up to the board, a, a bit like we did with TELUS. It's up to us to to throw our support around directions that can help us meet our goals. And if we always waited for the next strategy to act, we wouldn't accomplish very much, in my opinion. I'm not trying to undermine the strategy. I'm actually hoping the strategy will be ambitious and provide us pathways that can get us there. In the interim, there's a deadline. There's a local organization applying for some federal funding in the innovative space that has scale potential. I, I, I don't have much more to say. Thank you. Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'll be brief. It's getting late. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of, of providing the letter and I did want to make the distinction that 
it is a not-for-profit corporation. And I do think that while legally, perhaps it's the same, I'm not really sure what the difference is between a not-for-profit corporation and um, and a regular not-for-profit, if that's the same thing, but it, it's not a it's not a business that is competing with other businesses in the community. It's trying to do something new and innovative and move forward some climate goals. So um, I would agree with uh, Director Arbor that it's worthy of consideration. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions, hands up. Uh, so on that requested action, is anyone opposed? I'm gonna stick my neck out and say I am because it's too specific. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Director Grief. Hearing no others, that's carried. And we have requested action number two. Moved. Seconded. Second. Seconded uh, regarding the status of the Transition 2050 initiative and further actions to be considered. Vote of the full board. Is anyone opposed? And that's carried and requested action number three. Move three. Second. second. Moved and seconded, which is the next steps for the 20, Transition 2050 project in the Comox Valley Rural Context to refer to the Electoral Area Services Committee for consideration. Any other comments? Anyone opposed? And that is carried. Thank you. Item number three. Uh, the world-class shipbreaking regulations for BC and Canada mm -hmm. for BC. Second. Moved and seconded. And over to Director Arbor again. Thank you. This is a, a new one for the Valley and in many ways a new one for uh, the province and Canada. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of um, the, um, the operation that um, is happening in the Comox Valley because this, this resolution targets more the regulatory framework for these operations in general. Um, what was uncovered in researching shipbreaking, the shipbreaking sector, um, because there were questions in the community around um, the seemingly um, easy regulatory environment for those operations at the provincial and federal level. Um, and that was confirmed through basic research that it's, and, and also um, I connected with some of the, the policy uh, folks in, in Ottawa, that um, there is indeed a, a, a strong um, regulatory environment that's emerging internationally, but Canada has actually been a complete laggard and failed to join international efforts, including um, recent ones like the Hong Kong Convention or implementing um, regulatory regimes such as what we see in the Europe European Union. Um, so so this, this would basically be a, to take to AVICC. Um, and, uh, and also there's a, there's, a, there's a component there to take it to the federal government. Um, and uh, that would be uh, for the, the April conference. Um, I want to say that there's many things that are concerning that I hope a regulatory framework would help address. Um, in, in, in our area, in our experience, <clears throat> in my opinion, the Ministry of Forest and Natural Resources completely ignore the advice of local government and Comox First Nation. And they, uh, they, they basically did what I consider a, a poor job in terms of, of trying to provide oversight. Um, at the federal level, just again, lack of leadership and, and usually we think that Canada is, is uh, at, the, at the front of the pack on environmental uh, and workers' health matters. And it seems like we are not on this, in this particular sector. So basically a push to bring to AVICC and to try to get um, the conversation going at the province and the federal government. Everybody I talk to agrees that we should stop uh, sending ships overseas. A lot of the dismantling happens in India and Bangladesh, and there's actually um, a lot of these international efforts try to uh, stop that and build internal uh, country capacity to deal with their, their hazardous waste and recycling. And, um, and so the purpose of this uh, resolution would be to do precisely that, to help Canada create an environment and regulatory regime that supports the sector as opposed to um, a laissez-faire approach. 
Thank you, Director Arbor. Does any or any directors have any comments or questions around the uh, the resolutions coming going to be coming up to for us, Director Grief? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I totally support Director Arbor in this. I think that the uh, that the main goal should be to bring this to the federal debate. I mean, it's really uh, very disappointing that uh, the country like Canada does not have a policy on this. And it's being noted by other nations as well. So I think that's where this discussion is really gonna take place, not necessarily ABICC, but it's very important that we bring this to our own local associations so they can weigh in on it as well. So I, I urge everybody to support, thank you. Thanks, Director Grief. I don't see any other hands up in the room. And I just want to thank all of the uh, individuals and organizations that did, um, you know, the bulk of this research when they presented to us and showed us that the, there was a, a gaping hole in, in especially federal regulations. Um, and thank Director Arbor for bringing this forward. Uh, so on receipt, is anyone opposed to the receipt of the, the letter? Hearing and seeing none, that is Carrie. And we have a... Uh, recommendation. There's two parts to it uh, regarding uh, what AVCC should do and then forwarding resolution to FCM. Do we have a motion to move that? Moved. Second. And seconded. And any further comments or questions? Hearing and seeing none, is anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Now, before we move on to the addendum, I'm gonna give up the chair position so that uh, I may speak to it. I'll ask if Director Arbor would mind taking the chair on my behalf. So we have a late item, stream two funding for the UBCM poverty reduction grant for receipt. Move receipt. Okay, moved and seconded. And I guess we'll pass it over to uh, Director Hamir to introduce her item. Thank you, Chair. And thanks for uh, to the board for allowing us to discuss this. Um, just as a bit of a brief background, I believe the directors uh, recall that we did receive um, Stream one report regarding a poverty reduction plan for the Comox Valley in late 2021. Um, it was a report that was done in conjunction with staff um, and a number of, of organizations in the community that helped to outline um, what we were calling game changers that would really um, provide a, a huge impact on reducing poverty in the Comox Valley. Some of those game changers included um, affordable housing, um, reducing stigma, um, advocating for livable wages. Um, and you know, it was quite an extensive and all-inclusive um, study funded by UBCM. So much of the, the work was, um, was paid for by UBCM, with, but obviously with staff oversight. Um, there is a stream two funding now available through UBCM. Um, the call did go out. Our staff um, did reply that, you know, with all of the different projects that they are working on, that they're unable to write the, the application and, and really put, move this forward. Um, and so when the community, and particularly the Comox Valley Community Health Network, um, saw that we may not apply to this grant um, at all as a region, they have asked and requested the board um, to endorse them to do the, the writing of. Um, however, when an application goes into UBCM, it does need to go through a, a level of government. So what the ask is, is that um, very similar to how we fund um, the Comox Valley Health Network, that the CVRD be the fiscal host but that um, the Comox Valley Health Network be the backbone organization that oversees um, the grant application and then the actual implementation of these game-changing um, actions. I think um, supporting the health network to go forward 
um, builds on a very extensive and, and complete report that was already done by the same organization. Um, we are seeing how poverty issues are being exacerbated in our community, you know, through a number of, of reasons. And we, we discussed this um, earlier today. It's, it's really a, um, you know, a snowball effect of, of um, affordable housing, opioid crisis, um, you know, wages are not increasing. We know that staff are working on other parts of, of um, the strategy, um, be it stigma reduction or looking at affordable housing, but um, what's required is a, is a comprehensive and um, cohesive strategy that's, um, that really is uh, overseen by a, an, an organization. So um, the request is that the health network do apply for this, these funds. Um, one of the fears is that if uh, we do not apply in 2022, there's no guarantee that UBCM will have this fund in 2023. So we could potentially lose up to $150,000 of funding. Um, there's so much momentum right now in the community. Many of these organizations like the Coalition to End Homelessness, the Substance Use Strategy Group have already started working on these game changers. So I think what we risk as, an, as a community is if we don't apply for this funding, A, it shows really a lack of commitment on the regional district's part in providing a comprehensive plan and actioning those all of those game changers that the community really put a lot of time and effort into and could potentially exacerbate the poverty issues that we do have. So I hope that the board will um, support the recommendation to apply to enable the, the health network to apply and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Did uh, Nessia Henry's the staff want to wait uh, for comments or? Yeah, at some point before the board considers yeah, it. Yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to staff, Director Hillian. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a message circulated by the CAO, and in it, it made reference to um, some potential challenges uh, that the Community Health Network uh, might have uh, in terms of uh, fulfilling uh, such a grant at this time. I wonder, could we receive any more detail about uh, what, what those challenges are, uh, the transition that it's uh, apparently going through just now? Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, directors, I, I can respond to that question and maybe provide some of the feedback I, I wish the board to consider before they, uh, before they proceed with this resolution. And that is, I really appreciate the effort the Community Health Network is, is making and the partnership that we as a CVRD, our staff and directors have with the, the, the network. They are a very important organization in terms of advancing this forward. But I just worry that at this time, it is a little premature for the board to um, make the application because it is your application, regardless of who, who prepares it or otherwise. And it is the regional district that stands behind the application and is accountable for the financial spending, the reporting requirements, the timelines that are set by these grant programs. I just feel in the whole bigger picture at this time, unfortunately, the CVRD doesn't have the capacity to support this. But also, I think it's due process for the board. Yes, we have been uh, faced with game changers that can make a real effect in this community in addressing po poverty. Those were duly considered by our partners and our, our municipal members and otherwise. But at this time, the board has not yet put its mind to specifically which of those game changers you as a board are going to take responsibility for. Which of those game changers you may look at other levels of government for undertaking and being responsible for because they have the resources and these things need to be addressed in a global perspective. And what our local groups like the health network and the other partners have the capacity to do. It has been our um, commu communicated uh, strategy to you, the board, that we will bring forward a plan through the budget process, which will establish the work plan, which will tell me what the priorities will be of staff to respond to your, your priorities as you set through that process. Our staff are developing a variety of different options that we will present to you through the RGS uh, financial plan in mid-February. So unfortunately, I find at this time it is a little premature to, to go down the road. And as I mentioned to the board two weeks ago, 
We are struggling right now in terms of our ability to make our commitments. Tonight, you saw us fumble through bringing forward decisions that should have gone to the electoral area directors that we brought to you for the board. And why is that? Omicron. We've been in a pandemic, and as I said to the board two weeks ago, every level of this organization is taking extra days off, and that's the lost opportunity that I have to get projects like this. Over the last two years, we have actually implemented over $2 million of grant funding that were not part of work plans, were part of us working off the side of our desks and getting good things done. That includes the rethink monies and funds that we provided to local organizations. It's not a lack of commitment. It's a not a lack of ability for us to respond. I am just concerned that now is not the time. I appreciate that the Health Network has stepped up and offered to do this, but ultimately in their letter, I do not see the details that are required of a grant application. And for that, I will need our staff to make up that difference. And ultimately the Health Network is not a society or a board that can take the legal obligations and that's transferred to them. Those obligations will remain with the regional district. And at this time, the health network, I understand, is going through a transition where their executive assistant or, or their, the person that is helping them is moving on. And we, the regional district, will be helping them to find a different person. So while it may be regrettable to lose the opportunity of these funds, I think if you take your time and do it right, and you do it focused, thinking of the bigger picture, you will have better results in a shorter time frame for your community. Thank you. Um, are there other hands? Director Amir, go ahead. Thank you. And, and you know, thank you to, to Russell for that. Um, you know, I guess just a few comments. Um, uh, Lindsay is, again, is, is leaving the health network and she's given quite a, a, a long um, sort of runway so that things can be in place for, for her replacement. Uh, she is committed and, and she's, uh, she has mentioned that she will be here um, working with the health network un until and after the deadline for the uh, application to UBCM. So in terms of staffing for the actual application, um, that is ready to go. She's already looked at the application. Um, and because so much work has, has happened um, through phase one, um, she's quite certain that phase two will not require a ton of work and not require a ton of rewriting. Um, you know, I think our CIO has pointed out maybe a, a really huge difference in, in sort of thinking about um, who moves forward on deciding uh, what game changers we move on. Um, I, as a board member, um, do not have the expertise on what game changers our community needs to work on to reduce poverty. I think first and foremost, that needs to be done by people with lived experience. And quite frankly, we don't have the expertise around the table around that, but the Health Network does, and they have committed to centering the voices of people with lived experience in this phase two application. I understand Omicron has really hit our, our organization hard and just want to, again, lift up the health network for moving forward. This is a lot of work for them. They see that we are struggling. And I think they, I look at this more as an offer of help. We know that this work needs to be done. The health network is, is rolling up their sleeves to do it. Um, and I think we should thank them for that. Um, it really does speak to our, our lens and our driver of community support and community partnerships that you know they've offered to do this with us. I also want to point out that the District of Souk has just applied for the same fund in conjunction with their health network and doing very similar to what we are suggesting now. This, the district will just be the full flow through the fiscal host. The health network will be doing all of the work. So this is not really something that is new health networks across BC have been doing exactly the same, um, asking the regional districts to be fiscal hosts and um, doing the work on, on behalf of the community. They really are the ones with the expertise to move this forward. So I still believe that um, this is something very worthwhile to, um, to support. Would any uh, other directors like to join the conversation? And speaking to Director Hillian, just a point of clarification to either Director Hamir or CAO is uh, I think the, the email also referenced an existing poverty um, 
set of actions that 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 are underway and that we might be a little bit behind. I'm trying to remember from the email, Dr. Amir or CEO, what it might help inform the board. Anyways, sorry, my my apologies, and Alana, if you could just remind me the name of the current grant that we're working with our partners on. Um, thanks, Russell, through uh, Mr. Chair. Um, that's the Strengthening Communities Grant, and that's the $1 million that our community was awarded to address um, vulnerable populations arising from the pandemic. And that is where we are going to be speaking to you when we come to you on February 15th with the RGS budget to talk to you about the work um, that is wholly related to implementation of the poverty reduction strategy. Thank you. And so your requested action, Dr. Amir, just to repeat it, is um, I don't think we've moved and seconded it yet, did we? Um, yeah, so it's good we're still conversing. But essentially, you're asking for the regional district to still pursue um, this opportunity, which is due in mid-February, and for the Community Health Network to be the lead organization and for the regional district to remain the fiscal organization because we're the only ones that can apply. Does that sum it up? Okay, other yes. uh, oh, okay, another board hand went up, Dr. Mori. Thank you, Acting Chair. Um, well, one of the questions you just answered, I just wanted to be refreshed on the deadline mid-February. Uh, so one of the questions I had was, is there, um, is there a way for staff to meet with um, folks from the health, health network to get a little bit more clarity on their ideas and just to get a sense of, um, you know, flesh out the information a bit more um, to see if there's some feasibility there. And then just in responding to Alana's point, I'm wondering if you could give me a bit more information on what that looks like with the strengthening communities. Are you saying that some of the game changers under the poverty reduction would be part of the strengthening communities and would be addressed there? Um, be great to have some clarity on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll provide comment and Alana can add to it, but the Strengthening Communities is, is an example of a grant that we applied outside of our work plan, off the side through our desk because of an opportunity, right? And it stands to be a million dollar gain in terms of capacity within our community. And while it is a partnership with, with local service providers and the regional district, neither one of us can do this alone. We, 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 we have to do this together and we have to collaborate and we both need to be available. That, that program is getting things going, but it has been delayed. There has been complexities to, to getting the money out the door and getting things realized. And it's been over a hundred hours of staff time, even though we are not the principal service provider, but just to provide the support and the logistics to make sure our municipal partners are on side and we're working together. I raise it because it's an example of the complexities. It's say it fast, it sounds easy, but truly these grant pro programs need to be done in partnership with both all the partners are willing and able and have the capacity to do it. And while we have one half, I just don't know that we have the other half at this time. Dr. Grant? Yeah, thank you. So that was going to be my question. It sounded for me like what Russell was saying was it wasn't just writing the grant that was the problem, but it was the implementation after you've got the grant that was causing the the issue for him. And I, and I, I was really quite pleased at the last meeting when you kind of shut everybody down and said, hold it, we got no capacity. You got to stop throwing stuff at us. I, I, um, I really heard that and I hear it at our community all the time too. So, uh, you know, I appreciate that. We need to know when we're at the limit and we need to know when to, when to set back. It sounds to me like we've got, you know, a lot of grant money and things going into this and moving in the right direction. And I, and I think that oftentimes, you know, if you slow down and do it right, you get there a lot faster than just getting it done fast. So um, I'm, I think I'm probably on Russell's side on this one. I'm not sure if Dr. Amir, Dr. Mori uh, was first. So first one to talk, uh, go ahead. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite hear the, the second or the answer to my second question around whether the Strengthening Communities grant is going to include actions on those game changers as part and, of the and, and I think you were directing to Alana, is that possible? Yeah, Alana, if you could uh, comment on that, please. Thank you very Thanks. much. Um, 
through Tara Arbor. Yes, thank you very much. So um, we're looking at two pieces. One is, um, and this this was uh, this came out at our November twenty fourth, twenty twenty one report out on the phase one work. Um, so so one element of that was a key action, which was to start to build uh, local capacity among potential partners and players on the collective impact governance model. So that's the one piece of work that we're proposing we do. And in fact, staff has already started that by three of our staff are currently undertaking training right now to do that. And then the second piece that we're, we're coming forward with to you um, on February 15th is to talk to you a little bit about our focus on game changer number 10, which is around the anti-stigma so that people in our community have the uh, ability to, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially to live, work and play free of stigma. And so um, our action there is it dovetails really nicely with some of the other directions that you've given us as a board, sort of to that point about how do we decide which one we act on because of our, you know, our challenges around resources and our, our wanting to do something that reflects community interest. We looked at our other initiatives that we had on the go, either as strategic priorities or various resolutions that we've received from you in, in the last several months. And we landed on that one because we thought that it tied together a number of initiatives that both us as CBRD staff, as well as City of Courtney staff in particular, have been directed to do. So they're um, on the substance use strategy work, the direction that arose from the board to work with community partners to explore uh, options around the substance use piece. Um, and so, so that's why we're landing on that game ch changer number 10 and using money from the Strengthening Communities Grant um, uh, to partner with some of those, I don't want to speak to it too soon because we want to come with this as a proposal on February 15th, but to work with those organizations who are already doing some of the work around anti-stigma and funding them. Because to the point about, you know, who does what best, there are important community partners out there that are doing the work and are doing it well. And so that's really our interest is to, uh, where the stars are already aligning, to, to follow those stars um, and, and, you know, to be really clear about what our role could be in supporting this work. Thank you, Director Grieve. Thank you very much, it's been a long meeting. I'll be brief. Uh, I just suggest we listen to our staff's advice. My God, how much can we ask them to take on? Thank you. Thank you, over to uh, Director Hamir, then Director Swift. Oh, I don't mind Director Swift going. Okay, Director Swift, yeah, first speaker, right? We do that. Director Swift, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, um, I appreciate the uh, Health Network's work, and I think they've, uh, they're really prepared. And as you say, they know uh, <clears throat> best how to implement some of these things. But I also hear uh, the, uh, frustration at the CAO level and how much we keep piling on. And I'm, I'm finding with a lot of these reports and things that we end up getting that are the actions are not specific and, and they're good ideas, but they often don't apply to our level of government and we lack some costed solutions. So um, we need to be really specific in what we can take on. And I think, you know, we would feel better if just like the wood smoke program and all the other things that we've talked about today, if we took some baby steps and really made some impact that we would be better off. So I don't think that um, I'm going to support this resolution at this time. And I do, I do think it is partly just the timing as well. Uh, Dr. Amir. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, you know, a couple of uh, comments, um, because I am hearing, you know, how much time staff um, did spend with the, um, the Strengthening Communities Grant. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that was primarily because of the extreme weather shelter with the 100 hours that was spent there. Um, whereas, you know, we do have, uh, that is absolutely needed in supporting uh, the unhoused community um, in, in the Comox Valley. Um, I just want to reiterate, you know, all of the other parts that we are missing if we um, only go via, um, you know, the, those, the, 
the uh, you know supporting the unhoused, the vulnerable, and um, stigma reduction. Those two were listed in the um, in the poverty reduction strategy, but so was childcare, so was senior support, um, a living wage. I mean, we we're we're missing those other ones, which you know the grant does speak to. Um, so yeah, I hear the timing's not great, but these opportunities do not come every day. Um, there's a limited amount of money that the, the provincial government's put into the UBCM grant. Um, and, you know, I think finally, part of this is really giving up some of the control that I think we as, as elected officials and staff probably have over this project. It's really trusting our partner in the community health network that they have the expertise to take this on. Um, we've had a relationship with the health network for the last four years. I see it not as a, a group of individuals, but a network of organizations. It's a very strong network. And one person leaving does not make the, the organization crumble. In fact, there's many people who are stepping up um, to support this, this particular application going forward. So I still hope that we get the majority voting for it and uh, would love to see that application going through. Thanks. Thank you. This is, uh, yeah, one of those binary issues we have because either a grant will go in application with our support or it won't. Um, are there further speakers? And, and for my own clarity, I, I, because I'm not super close to that work, um, are we dealing with different funders in terms of um, the grant is one, the other one, the strengthening communities, is that a federal or is that a provincial one? Or what's there, is there a relationship between those? those uh, uh, thank you. The one currently being considered as proposed by Director Hamir is a UBCM program. Uh, they administer and obviously federal provincial funds. And Alana, where does the money come from the strengthening communities? Uh, thank you. Through the chair, this is um, federal and provincial funding administered also through UBCM. So both grants are through UBCM. Okay. Director Amir, um I don't see further speakers, so hopefully directors have been able to wrap their minds around it. Um, I think I'll do a roll call because we already got an indication that oh, vote on receipt. Vote on receipt first. That's right. We haven't moved it. Uh, so on receipt, all in favor? Thank you. No one opposed. And uh, I guess the requested action to be moved by. Dr. Hamir and a seconder. Is there a seconder? Second. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Director Moray. So, um, any further comments before we move to the vote? Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I feel very, very torn about this. This is a remarkable opportunity, and I do hear what staff are saying about. Um, capacity and I, I feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to work closely with Lindsay McGinn and the Community Health Network in, in sort of transitioning what was the uh, our Courtney uh, uh, drug strategy to a region-wide thing and that required the city of Courtney to be the fiscal host and the work to be done by the Community Health Network and having seen that organization uh, be created from scratch through Lindsay's work I was impressed by how little the city of Courtney had to carry in terms of administrative work and how capable and committed Lindsay is. And I know that she said that she'll stay to like beyond her end date if necessary to, to make this happen. Um, having seen the community health network and her personally put together this, this, this region wide effort out of nothing, out of whole, whole cloth, I. I have confidence that this can be done without um, it having an undue blowback on staff. And I, I do, it's, it, I am very torn in saying this because I do hear what's being said, but this is an opportunity to, um, to gather resources for things that are sorely needed for our community. So um, I will be supporting this, but it's, um, it's not without some awareness of what a difficult decision this is. Anybody else on the motion on the floor? Okay, then I'll do a roll call. Thank you. 
Um, Director Murray. Sorry, you can answer in favor or uh, opposed. Oh, sorry. I thought that you thought that I was. Um, no, talking. No, no. I'm just. I'm. I'm on the vote the, now. Unless, unless there's the other hands. Yeah. yeah. In in favor. Thanks. Director McCollum. In favor. Director Hillian. Reluctantly in favor. Director Cole Hamilton. As I said, also reluctantly in favor. Director Swift. Reluctantly opposed. Director Grant. Opposed. Director Grieve. Opposed. And Director Amir. Thank you. So the vote passes. Oh, Sullivan, that, sorry. Alternate Director Sullivan. Uh, I have four. In favor. Kate, thank favor. you very much. So that passes. Oh, I do? Yes. <laughs> that, that was the privilege of chair. As a chair, I sit on the fence. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in favor. Okay. So the motion passes. And um, with that, we will, um, I believe, unless there's other items, um, we're at termination. termination. Thank you. And Director Grant, anybody opposed to termination? <laughs> That's true. Thank you, everybody. That was a long meeting. Thanks to Chair Mayor for uh, for taking the bulk, uh, the last bulk of it. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Nice try. <laughs> yeah.